You have tuned in to the ARC Centre of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies Annual Symposium. My name is Alana Gresh. I am the Centre's Assistant Director and the MC for this event. The ARC Centre of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies acknowledges that Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are the original inhabitants and traditional custodians of this continent and that they have unique cultural and spiritual relationships to the land and waters. We pay our respects to the nations whose land we are currently located and honour their elders. Before we begin the symposium, there are a few housekeeping issues that I need to go over with you. Firstly, the chat function and reaction functions have been disabled. The audience is also unable to turn on their microphone and camera. If you'd like to ask a question to one of our speakers, at the bottom of the screen is a control panel with a Q&A function. Click on the icon, type in your question and click enter. The question will be received by a moderator. Our expectation is that all interactions during the symposium are constructive and that attendees behave with respect and consideration for others. Sound and video may be affected by your personal network speeds and we can't control that here. Plug into your ethernet cable for the best connection. Earphones and headsets make it easier to hear but are not required. It is now my pleasure to introduce the Vice-Chancellor of James Cook University, Professor Sandra Harding, who will be providing the opening address to our symposium. Sandra, could you please turn on your camera and your microphone? Thank you, Alana, um, and thank you for that warm uh, acknowledgement to country as well. Um, and I echo uh, these sentiments there, and I appreciate that uh, having been uh, acknowledged. I want to thank you all uh, for, thank for inviting me to make some open remarks today. I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, certainly, our university is proud to host the World Class Research Centre at James Cook University, which is the ARC Centre of Excellence in its various guises. And I know that many of you will know, perhaps much better than I do, because you were there at the very beginning, um, about the story of the uh, COE since its establishment in 2005 as the ARC Centre of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies. It was renewed in 2014 as the COE for Integrated Coral Reef Studies with the inclusion of social science research after highly competitive expression of interest uh, process was uh, navigated. And during that process, I have some numbers here. It was 103 initial EOIs for the 2014 COE round. 24 applications were invited to submit four proposals and 12 proposals were funded, including, of course, ours. I'd like to acknowledge um, and to recognise our university partners, the University of Queensland, the University of Western Australia and the Australian National University, and also recognise almost 60 Australian and international organisation partners, including, of course, the Australian Institute of Marine Sciences, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, Stanford University and World Fish, among many others. Now, the growth of the centre and the contribution of the centre is, is nothing less than awe-inspiring as far as I'm concerned. And I'm sure this is a, a general view and a general perception uh, because behind that perception is a, is a truth and a reality. Just having a look at some of these numbers in terms of the growth between 2005 and 2020 make the case. 15 research fellows uh, were in place in the COE in 2006 growing to 47 in 2020, 132 publications in 2006 and 421 so far this year. And indeed from the period 2014, so the second iteration of the COE to 2020, there were 2,551 publication outputs and 276,788 citations. Website hits in 2006 were 600,000. In 2020, it was 10.2 million. And between 2014 and 2020, we count 88.6 million website hits. We've had 14 tall poppies, young tall poppies, 13 decras, six future fellows, and four Australian laureates, 276 awards, prizes, and recognitions, including Eureka Prizes. This growth, the growth that is, that is evident for all to see in the numbers, an astonishing level of achievement, speaks to the significance of the COE and its work 
And this great significance, as we would all know, is expressed daily. It's hard, and indeed, in my own view, it's nigh on impossible to overestimate the importance of the COE of you and your work, not just to the participating institutions, but to our nation and to our world. I want to congratulate you and thank you most sincerely for all you have achieved. And of course, um, I'm sure that you won't mind me taking this opportunity to warmly acknowledge and do so in awe of all he has achieved personally and in leading the COE, I want to most warmly acknowledge the efforts and contributions of the Centre's inaugural director, distinguished Professor Terry Hughes, who's retiring at the end of 2021. Terry is globally recognised as a scholar leader and as an eminent person in his field. JCU has been so very fortunate to have you in our ranks, Terry, and the leadership of the COE and its work would not have been what it has been without you. There is so much here for you personally to be very proud of. I could go on very easily, but I'm sure there will be other opportunities to acknowledge Terry in the coming weeks and months, and I certainly look forward to those. And with that, let me wish you all an excellent, informative and satisfying symposium. I can say without hesitation, your work, your deliberations today, your work in the past and the work that is to come have an importance well beyond the confines of this Zoom room. We are depending on you to press on with your work to our benefit and to the benefit of future generations. So if I can say, Alana, and to all who are out there, have a good meeting and thanks again for inviting me along. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra, for that wonderful opening. It's a great way to start our symposium today. It is now my pleasure to introduce the Director of the ARC Centre of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies, Professor Graham Cumming, and he'll be providing a welcome to our symposium. Graham, can you please turn on your camera and microphone and I will unshare my screen. Right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Professor Sandra Harding for her official opening address. Thank you. Uh, and to add that it's a pleasure to be here at our ARC Centre of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies this afternoon. Before speaking a bit more about today's symposium, I'd like to note that I'm speaking from Bindal Land. And I'd like to offer a particular welcome to some of our distinguished guests, Professor Sandra Harding, the JCU Vice Chancellor, Ms. Liz Fisher, the Director of Major Investments from the Australia Research Council, Dr. Robert Munn, Executive Director, Engineering and Information Sciences, Australian Research Council, Professor Chris Coughlin, the Provost of JCU, and Professor Hugh Possingham, the Chair of the Centre's Adv Advisory Board and Queensland Chief Scientist. I know you're busy people and we appreciate you taking the time to tune in today. Of course, I'd like to warmly welcome all of our members from our four university nodes and our partners. Um, Professor Harding's already run through a list of who, the, who those are, so I won't repeat that, but everybody um, welcome, and it's great to be here this afternoon. So today's symposium is a significant occasion. It's an occasion with a capital O. At the basic level, it marks the end of one long-term and I think highly notable research cycle and the beginning of a new one. At a more profound level, it marks one of those points at which we collectively reconfigure and reimagine ourselves as a research group and as a community. In keeping with our theme of looking both backwards and forwards, we've invited our plenary speakers and panel to consider and reflect on both the legacy of the center and the future research directions that it suggests. So I look forward to hearing these different perspectives and I'm only gonna offer a very brief summary of my own. Over the course of two successive centers, starting in 2005, we've directly graduated 349 PhD students and published over 4,000 peer-reviewed journal articles. Many of these have been in top quality scientific journals. I think it's fair to say, um, without arrogance, that over this period, the center has transformed coral reef science. At the moment, we're still publishing scientific research at a rate of more than one peer-reviewed journal article per day, and many of these publications are in top-notch research journals. The Centre has also been able to play what I think is a major role in many conservation successes and in bringing new perspectives and benefits to people outside the research community. 
for example, I'm, I'm led to understand the center's work on the impact of green or fully protected areas on fish populations across the Great Barrier Reef. It's been vitally useful in developing ecologically sustainable management strategies. At what some people would consider the other end of the spectrum, I think uh, research undertaken by center researchers on the role of women in fisheries has highlighted the importance of gendered roles in society for food security and will hopefully continue to contribute to improved social equity. And these extremes capture um, the, some of the range and diversity of the research that we've undertaken at the center. To those of you who've been part of the center's journey, uh, you'll also know that the center means much more than research to many of us. It's been an integral part of many of our lives for many years. It's provided not only funding support, but also career development, training across a wide range of diverse skills and unparalleled networking opportunities. The center's become synonymous with a community rather than simply a research organization. And I think of this as one of the key reasons underlying its spectacular success. Looking forward, the ARC Center for Coral Reef Studies has built a firm foundation for future marine research. But many questions remain. As I'm sure you're all aware, our oceans are changing, raising new questions and challenges. As our new research cycle begins, we're contemplating questions that would have been dismissed as doom and gloom scenarios 20 years ago. For example, will coral reefs and other marine ecosystems collapse or simply undergo a gradual decline? What will coral reefs look like in the future? And how will coastal human communities cope with ongoing changes in the world's marine ecosystems? The answers to these questions are extremely important for society. They urgently require the attention of excellent researchers like yourselves. At the same time, I'd like to note that I'm sure many of you have also noticed the role of research in society is changing. Researchers have started to face up increasingly more to their own biases and backgrounds. And society has challenged our outdated conceptions of the purposes and goals of research. My own personal prediction in the future is that we'll see an increased emphasis on working in diverse teams, on undertaking research that both provides intellectual leadership and contributes to society, and on questions of equity, justice, and indigenous knowledge and rights. I would encourage you, each of you working in these areas to embrace these trends to move forward with the tide of our times so that you can stay relevant and keep making valuable contributions to our planet and its people. Being an effective research organization demands that we not only stay engaged with current knowledge and trends, but also ideally that we move a little bit ahead of the, ahead of the pack. In keeping with what we perceive as the new and most significant directions of the winds of change, we've proposed to the ARC a research program for a new center. It focus on, focuses on the need for systems level perspectives, for much deeper integration between different sectors and elements of what we work on. And the idea that research both can and should play a vital role in building adaptive capacity and learning in society at large, not just within the research community. I think the success of environmental management in today's world is going to be measured as much in terms of human well being as it is in terms of biodiversity or ecological integrity. Our proposal for a new center of excellence for sustainable tropical seascapes contains many novel and exciting ideas for overcoming barriers to sustainability. They include, for example, a deeper recognition of the interdependence of different elements of marine ecosystems and coastal societies, the deliberate development of the kinds of collaborative networks of scientists, practitioners, and stakeholders that research tells us are most likely to be effective, and a range of new and exciting inter and transdisciplinary research directions. So I'd like to emphasize that although ARC funding for, for this particular center is ending, as a research community, we remain in a strong position with many, many exciting opportunities ahead. Times of change are always a bit uncertain, but I think they're a necessary part of the cycles of growth, maturity and renewal that underpin life itself. So in concluding this brief summary, I'd ask for your patience and your trust as we explore and develop new directions forward and for your contributions. Among the center's many contributions to the advancement of marine science in Australia is the creation of a truly excellent and diverse body of younger scientists. And I'm optimistic that with your input and help in particular, we'll successfully maintain and build upon the momentum that we've built. A few minutes left, I hope, and I'd like to spend them on introducing our next speaker, Professor Terry Hughes.
Now you might be wondering what this is. And I'll tell you, it's a picture of a right arm. It's not my right arm, it's a random picture I found on the internet. I'd like to use this picture to point out that Terry's list of achievements, if you were to print it out in 12 point times New Roman font in keeping with ARC regulations, is longer than my right arm. In fact, it's longer than anyone's right arm. His achievements include the award of many major prizes, vast numbers of papers in nature and science, huge numbers of publications, citations, and of course, the, cent the successful development and management of 13 years, two successive ARC centers of excellence for coral reef studies. I could go more of Terry through uh, many more of Terry's different awards and achievements in detail, but I think a more important thing to focus on is that he's officially retiring at the end of November. And Terry, first from all of us, a massive thank you for all that you've done to build and nurture the center of excellence. I think uh, if we were all in a room together, we'd be able to overwhelm Terry with a, a wave of applause and a standing ovation. Um, but I'll, I'll do my best uh, in the short time that I have. Now, when I was preparing to introduce Terry, I found myself thinking about another question that still intrigues me. What is Terry planning to do next? Those of you who know Terry will hopefully agree with me that it seems unlikely that he'll simply sit on his pleasant deck in Townsville, contemplating the ocean, drinking fine red wine. And I began to wonder, could he possibly work for the government, track down and eliminate invasive species? Or might he simply become an international man of mystery? These didn't seem to quite fit. So in search of inspiration, I did the obvious thing as one does in, in uh, these kind of dramatic scenarios. I went down to Hughes Street in Townsville. And if you look closely at this slide, you might notice something peculiar. I've circled it in red for you. This is obviously an important clue to Terry's future plans. Could it possibly be that Terry's future lies in a gardening business, contemplative, relaxed occupation, communing with nature? But surely Terry, having spent his whole life thinking about the sea, would be unlikely to undertake a terrestrial uh, retirement. Luckily, the sign on the gate was far clearer. And it was at this point that I finally realized the full truth of Terry's daring plan to single-handedly defeat the scourge of macroalgal growth on the reef, obviously with uh, close sponsorship from Shell and the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. So jokes aside, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce with no further delay, the founding director of the center, and one of the best known and most cited marine scientists in the world, Terry Hughes. Hi everyone. Um, could somebody nod their head just so that you can see the first PowerPoint slide? You're all good to go, Terry. Okay, great. And the sounds all right, Alana? Yep, sounds good too. Okay, thank you uh, very much, everyone. Thank you, um, Graeme, uh, for the wonderful introduction. Um, by the way, California has just banned the sale of petrol-driven lawnmowers from 2024. So if you have a lawnmower, it's a stranded asset. Um, I'm going to begin uh, with and end with uh, two of my tweets. Uh, this one shows a picture of me at Discovery Bay Marine Lab in the year that I turned 21. And if you read the wording there, you can get a picture for just how much coral reef science has changed in the course of one academic career. So over a relatively short span of 40 years or so, coral reefs have transformed. Uh, and one of the major drivers of that, of course, apart from overfishing and coastal pollution is anthropogenic climate change. And I'll be talking today about climate change, coral bleaching, particularly uh, the three events we've had in the last five years I'll be presenting some new data, which looks at the five events since 1998, including stuff you won't have seen before about 2020, the most recent events. So I'm gonna talk about degree heating weeks or heat exposure as a driver of coral bleaching. Then I'll talk about the recurrent bleaching we've seen in 98, 20, uh, 2002, 2016, 17, and 2020. 
Uh, and I'll look at those events, not just as one-off events, but as a sequence of bleaching events and their interactive effects on the Great Barrier Reef. And then I'll present some data and some discussion on how the Great Barrier Reef is changing. The Barrier Reef has already begun a trajectory which will continue for decades, if not centuries uh, to come. Uh, we're seeing disappearing spatial refuges, places that have not yet been damaged by coral bleaching. We're seeing increased spatial heterogeneity or patchiness and the way in which reefs and populations on the Great Barrier Reef are interconnected is changing also with huge implications for the resilience and recovery of the reef. These are five sets of maps. The top ones show the pattern of bleaching, which James Carey and I measured in 2016, 17 and 2020 from a small airplane. The two older uh, maps on the top left were done by Ray Berkelman when he uh, worked at Ames and published in 2004. The bottom set of five maps are from NOAA. Those are the patterns of heat exposure measured as degree uh, heating weeks. And you can see if you compare vertical pairs of maps that the red in the bottom set of maps generally matches quite well with the red in the top set of, match, uh, of maps. In other words, the bleaching is triggered by high levels of heat exposure measured as degree heating weeks. But there are some anomalies, uh, particularly in later years. So if we look at 217, the map for heat shows a lot of heat in the region north of Cairns, halfway up towards the Torres Straits, but relatively little bleaching in that region in 2017. And similarly, we had a lot of heat in the far north in 2020, but no bleaching in, in, uh, in, that, in that region. So it seems like the relationship is pretty tight, but it may be changing. The question I've posed here is, can we use degree heating week data from satellites as a proxy for bleaching severity? Do we really need to go into an airplane or underwater to measure bleaching directly? Why can't we just download the information from NOAA's website? And if you look at the percentage of reefs that were correctedly, correctedly uh, predicted as um, severely bleached in each of those years, there's a really very tight fit uh, between the degree heating week exposure and the level of bleaching that we observed. Uh, degree heating week correctly predicted the level of bleaching in 80 to 90% of, of cases in each year. But this tight correlation doesn't tell you exactly how much bleaching occurred for a given level of heat exposure. To do that, we need to look at the bleaching response curves, the relationship between the amount of bleaching observed and the heating exposure that occurred each year. And we call that a, a bleaching response curve. And here are the five bleaching response curves for the five events that we've seen. And you can see that there's a lot of variation in, uh, from one event to the next in the amount of bleaching that occurs for a given level of degree heating weak exposure. We're all familiar with the four threshold, uh, four degree heating weeks triggers bleaching and eight triggers Mortality, well, those are pretty rubbery figures because we're seeing a huge amount of variation in these response curves from one event to the next. And in particular, if we look at these two bottom curves, they're way to the right and much flatter. That was in 2017 and 2002 when it took a lot more heat to produce the same level of bleaching as in other years. And I'll go on to explain in a minute that that's due to interactions or the history of recurrent bleaching events interactions between an earlier event and the current one. There's also a lot of variation in bleaching response curves in space. If we compare the northern, central, and southern regions of the Great Barrier Reef, and here I've picked two years, 2017 on the left and 2020 uh, on, on the right. So you can see in 2017, the central and southern region had virtually identical overlapping bleaching response curves. They behave the same way in response to a given level of heat exposure. But the set in the northern section of the Great Barrier Reef in 2017, which had been severely bleached in 2016, we saw very little bleaching in year two. And we think the reason for that is mainly because the bleaching susceptible species had been so badly depleted that we were left with a 
a heat tolerant assemblage in 2017 and it took a great deal of heat to produce only low levels of bleaching. Similarly, in 2020, we see different regional responses where the south in blue was the most sensitive to heat exposure. The south had ex escaped bleaching in 2016 and 2017, and it was by far the most sensitive in 2020. The central region, which bleached badly in 2017, was intermediate, and again, the north in 2020 saw very low levels of bleaching. So really what this variability in space and time means is that we do actually have to go and measure bleaching directly. We can't use degree heating week as an accurate proxy for the level of bleaching that occurs for a given level of heat exposure. If we superimpose the maps that I showed you earlier of the level of bleaching in each event, uh, if we do that for 2016, 2017 and 20, we get this map. It shows for 573 reefs that we repeatedly censused in all three events, the level of bleaching. So red in this map is reefs that bleached in category four, which is more than 60% of the corals uh, were, were bleached. You can see that these last three events have severely bleached 80% of the reefs on the Great Barrier Reef. And if we include the lower categories of bleaching, which are shown here in orange, uh, yellow, and, and light blue, then 98% of the reefs on the Great Barrier Reef have bleached to some extent, including milder levels of bleaching in the last three events. Only 2% of reefs escaped from bleaching entirely. You can see there's a paler area in the outer part of the most northern part of the Great Barrier Reef. Most of those reefs were category two in 2017. And you can see that the swains are doing far better than the rest of the Great Barrier Reef, particularly this southern part, which is dark blue, and also the southern portion of the Capricorn bunker group. So what we're seeing as a consequence of these recurrent bleaching events is an increase in the patchiness of the levels of exposure to climate change that different reefs show. You can see these gradients, which are often very tight, going from blue to yellow to orange to red at a relatively small scale. And here's an example of that from the Capricorn bunker group down in this region. This is a relatively small area. It's about 150 kilometers square. And it has all five bleaching categories in it from blue, which is no bleaching, to red, which is more than 60% of the corals are white. And you can see that even reefs that are at 10 or 20 kilometers apart can vary quite substantially in the level of bleaching that they experience. This data is from 2020. So increasingly, we're seeing more and more spatial heterogeneity as a consequence of the recent history of bleaching. And this shows two ways of looking at that based on data from 145 reefs that have been surveyed for bleaching in all five events since 1998. So the map on the left shows the number of times that these 145 reefs have bleached. It ranges from never uh, in, uh, in blue, so zero bleaching frequency on the map on the left, up to a very small number of reefs that have bleached in all five events. You can see that the south has lower frequency and greater return times than the central part of the reef, uh, which has had more, le more le higher levels of recurrent bleaching than elsewhere in the Great Barrier Reef. Another way of looking at that same data is to estimate the number of years since the last bleaching event occurred. Reefs in blue have never bleached. There's no 1998 reefs on here because all of the reefs that bleached in 1998 have now re-bleached again. So they bleached again in 2002 or in the last three events. But you can see from this map on the right that the majority of reefs have, 80% of them, have bleached uh, in 2016, 2017, and 2020. So most reefs on the Great Barrier have been recently disturbed by uh, severe levels uh, of bleaching. So we're seeing increasingly a patchwork of reefs, including reefs that are 
chronically depleted reefs that bleached coastal reefs in 1998 that have never fully recovered. We're seeing depleted um, recently damaged reefs uh, in say 2020. We're seeing uh, depleted recovering reefs. And we're also seeing uh, a, a diminishing number of undamaged or fully recovered reefs. And each of those categories has a different assembly, uh, a different mix of species. Uh, many of the recently damaged reefs that are now recovering, that recovery has been driven by fast growing, relatively weedy acropores and poslopores, which actually makes them more prone to the, the inevitable sixth bleaching event uh, whenever that um, occurs. One of the consequences of losing lots of corals um, is that reproduction and recruitment and connectivity are depleted as a consequences. And we published these two maps showing before, after levels of coral recruitment uh, in 2019. Um, we showed in that paper the relationship between the loss of coral cover on the x-axis and the change in recruitment uh, from before versus afterwards. So basically, as you go down that fitted line, as coral cover is diminished, you see more and more reduction in reproduction and recruitment by corals. So as more corals move out of the never damaged into the recently damaged and recovering phase, we'll see uh, a mosaic of uh, regenerative capacity uh, along the length of the Great Barrier Reef. So with the erosion of spatial refuges, um, I think it's time to uh, review and probably move on from the notion of a resilient network of reefs that could ideally repopulate the rest of the, of the reef that's more prone to bleaching. The spatial refuges on the Great Barrier Reef are now a, a very small bottom right corner in, in the Swains. And it's not um, likely that they could be a demographically significant source of coral larvae to the rest of the Great Barrier Reef, which lies um, upstream uh, during the summer um, breeding season. Instead, I think what we're seeing is the emergence of a spatial mosaic where depending on the recent history of bleaching, depending on where reefs are on this curve, this fitted line on the right, recruitment is likely to be local and it's likely to be a window of recruitment from a reef that is partially recovered from the last bleaching event before the next bleaching event um, occurs. That's an incredibly different dynamic uh, from the dynamic that we have traditionally measured in the, in the map on the far left. The other thing that's happening is shown here by these two colors, blue and yellow. That's the proportion of coral recruits that are brooders versus spawners. And after the 2016 bleaching, we saw that proportion, that ratio changing um, in favor of brooders. And because brooders and spawners have different uh, larval behaviors and uh, larval durations, that means that the mix of recruits and the mix of adults that result from those recruits is also driving a shift in the assemblage structure and dynamics of the Great Barrier Reef. I put this slide in uh, to wrap up um, because I, I, I would like people to be mindful of the sort of mind numbing arithmetic of the decline and recovery of the Great Barrier Reef and its responses to global warming. If you consider that uh, a square meter of healthy reef has about 50 corals the size of a, a clenched fist, that's a reef in good condition, then 10,000 square meters per hectare and 100 hectares per square meter very rapidly leads you to mind numbing, eye wateringly large numbers of corals uh, in, say, an area of 1,000 square meters of coral reef real estate. Um, we probably lost a few tens of billions of corals in the three coral bleaching events in the last five years. But we have a glass half full, half empty, and we're seeing some recovery on reefs that didn't bleach uh, in 2017 and 2020 that are now recovering from the severe bleaching in the Northern Barrier Reef in 2016. But I do, I do encourage people to consider 
how big these numbers are. I think the challenge now is to look after the tens of billions of corals that are still out there, because our capacity to grow numbers like this in the laboratory or in a coral nursery is obviously um, very limited. So coral restoration is feasible at small scales, but it's neither feasible nor affordable at larger scales. So to wrap up, recurrent bleaching has already changed the Great Bear Reef for at least uh, your lifetime, uh, if you're a PhD student and probably longer, but tens of billions of corals survive. The reef is going through huge selection events. We're all familiar with the winners and losers story and also the shift in the composition of uh, recruits. There's also genetic changes going on, although they're not uh, being adequately um, recorded. Um, restoration, in my view, is not the large scale answer. Reducing emissions and local drivers is. But the main point I want to make is that everything we thought we knew about how the Great Barrier Reef behaves as a complex dynamic ecosystem is wrong. And we have to relearn it. And that is a huge research challenge for the next generation of research. And I wish you all well in that endeavor. And I'll end with one other tweet, which is, I think, uh, a reflection of the role that we as scientists have in uh, translating this science and communicating it to the broader public. And I'll let you in on a little secret. This tweet has been viewed by 1.1 million people. So maybe our message is being heard after all. Thank you so much, Terry. I have a question here from Kevin, one of our PhD students. Hi, Kevin. Are corals dying at similar rates upon bleaching, even after repeat bleaching events? Um, uh, thanks for the question, Kevin. Um, no, they're not. So um, mortality of corals due to uh, heat stress actually very complicated. The common narrative in the literature, particularly the older literature, is that, the, that bleach corals are nutritionally compromised and they slowly starve to death if the zooxanthellae don't repopulate the corals' tissues. We were surprised in 2016 to find when we went out to measure mortality twice, that half of the corals that died in 2016 died in days to a couple of weeks. They died directly from heat stress. They cooked, the, the coral tissue just dissolved and disintegrated. Um, it, they, it was not slow starvation um, because of too few zooxanthellae. When we went back after nine months, we could also see that many of the corals that were partially killed, that were fragmented and battered and bruised, they su finally succumbed to their wounds, if you like. Coral disease went through the roof in the aftermath of coral bleaching. And the per capita predation rate on the surviving corals, particularly on reefs where we saw 80 or 90% mortality of corals also increased very strongly because things like Drupella and Crown of Thorns starfish had nothing like the mortality rate of the coral. So it's pretty complex. Um, as I showed you in the talk, it took a lot more heat in 2017 in the North to produce the same level of bleaching. Um, and we saw lower levels of mortality in 2017. We didn't measure it as extensively as the year before. But I think your question um, points at the need to understand these events as sequences of interacting events. We no longer have the luxury of studying bleaching as a, a one-off thing. We have to know um, what are the cumulative additive impacts of five interacting bleaching events uh, what can we tell from studying them as five events that we can't gain information for by studying them as one-offs? And I think that's a really important future research question. Mm. We have a similar question from Jessica Stella. Um, so I'll move on to the, another one actually, which is quite different from Yolanda Waters. What are your thoughts on restoration as a public engagement tool? Uh, restoration certainly does um, uh, improve public uh, awareness, and I think that's a good thing. Um, uh, my concern, though, is that restoration could also convince people that the clever scientists can fix this. Um, and I think we need a little bit 
of humility about uh, what human intervention can do in terms of regrowing huge uh, populations uh, that are now depleted, but still number in the tens of billions. Restoration too is, is often focused on fast growing uh, weedier corals, particularly acropores. That's certainly the case for many breeding programs, uh, for larval harvesting and assisted migration, and of course for coral gardening. Um, nobody's restoring parietes or uh, slow growing mound shaped corals that can live centuries uh, because it's too hard. Um, so for those species, certainly uh, restoration is not an option. Uh, and I think we need both approaches. Um, they're certainly not substitutes for each other and I don't think anyone's claiming that. Um, but I think we shouldn't let people off the hook who are responsible for increasing global emissions uh, because that's the number one issue that needs to be addressed with a lot of urgency. Thank you so much, Terry. And Thank you so much for the last 15 years of your leadership here at the centre. And I look forward to having a wine with you tonight. Oh, it's a deal. <laughs> Your shout. So next up, we have a short film on the centre's research and impact on the effects of climate change on coral reefs. And following that, we have a panel discussion on the same topic led by Ryan Lowe. Thank you so much. Bleaching occurred on the Great Barrier Reef in 2016, and tragically again a year later in 2017, and then a year ago in 2020. So we've seen three bleaching events on the Great Barrier Reef in just five or six years. With just those three events since 2016, about 98% of the reefs on the Great Barrier Reef have experienced mild to severe levels of bleaching. Corals are animals and they contain tiny little algae in their tissue that provide the most energy and also as colour. The algae are doing photosynthesis like any plant and um, when it's too hot then they're producing some substances that are toxic to the coral and so the coral basically expels the algae and the corals start looking white and that's what we call in coral bleaching. If the bleaching lasts long enough, then the corals starve because they don't have the algae to feed them. In late 2015, as the temperatures at the beginning of summer were ramping up and up and up, we knew that the severe bleaching event was highly likely. Uh, I convened uh, a nationwide group, we called it the National Coral Bleaching Task Force. It comprised all of the nodes of our centre and our partners, because at that time we were a diverse and very large group, we could put a small army of people in the air and underwater to measure the extent of bleaching at the scale of the Great Barrier Reef. And there are very few groups around the world who could attempt research at that sort of scale. It takes about eight days in a small plane to crisscross the length of the Great Barrier Reef. We fly very low and we record the extent of the bleaching as we crisscross about a thousand reefs. Because they were up in the air doing aerial surveys, obviously every day they would learn more about what was happening with the bleaching event and straight away they would communicate that back to us so we were able to keep everybody from local school children to the Minister for Environment informed about what was happening on the Great Barrier Reef during those huge and very important events. I think it was absolutely amazing how quickly the centre was able to mobilise um, scientists all over the country to monitor this event and I think we were among the first to really be out there on the reefs and to document what was happening. And then we were also able to, to use the same technologies and methodologies. We were able to produce data sets that really very few other people or institutions in the world can produce. And this has a huge impact on our understanding of how these increasingly frequent and intense bleaching events will actually impact the resilience and the future of coral reefs worldwide, not just in Australia.
has had a huge ecological impact, uh, particularly the 2016 event, which was the most extreme. It killed about 51% of the corals in the northern third of the Great Barrier Reef. On some reefs in 2016, in the far northern part of the Great Barrier Reef, we saw more than 80% of the corals die over a very short period. That was really shocking. In 2017, we set out to look at the consequences for the reproduction and replenishment of corals on the reef. We found a huge drop in the number of babies that were produced after those bleaching events. And that's really important for the replenishment of the Great Barrier Reef. Dead corals don't make babies. But the capacity for the Great Barrier Reef to rebound from these not just one, but now three bleaching events, has been compromised. Uh, it's very confronting to see the level of, of damage that we have documented. If we are to um, restrain global temperatures at 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial, we get to a point where there will be a lot less coral, but there will be still coral perhaps as much as 30% of the corals today will survive. If we can flatten the curve essentially for temperature rise, we'll get to a point where corals may get, come back uh, quite effectively because the conditions are stabilised. But if we don't, and we're in, on a current track at the moment where we don't do this, uh, we will just get to temperatures where coral reefs will be a distant memory. Scientific understanding from the Centre of Excellence is absolutely essential. We take that information, we build it into our communication products, particularly our Outlook report, and we also build it into our position statements. Our position on climate change is that the world needs to undertake the fastest and strongest possible action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In particular, meeting the objectives of the Paris Agreement is absolutely critical. So holding further warming to well below two degrees C, seeking options to keep it to only one and a half. Those are numbers that are absolutely essential for the future of the Great Barrier Reef. All right, welcome everyone to this panel discussion focused on the topic of coral reefs in a warming world. So my name is Ryan Lowe and I'm based at, at the University of Western Australia node of the center. And I'm also um, the co-lead of the program three, which focuses on responding to a changing world. So the short film we just watched in Terry's talk provided an excellent introduction to the many challenges coral reefs face in a warming world. This also highlighted some of the major contributions the center has made to understanding the impacts of climate change on reefs, um, also identifying future trajectories and importantly helping identifying solutions. The film also um, highlighted the important work the center has done in close partnership with reef management agencies and, and uh, decision makers and its contribution to stimulate policy debate around the urgency to address climate change not just nationally, but I think it's really important to emphasize the significant impact the center has had um, on influencing policy debate on the national, um, on the international stage. So I'll now um, briefly introduce the four panel members who have been um, very influential members of the center, and I'm sure are, are very well known to many of you. Um, but just before um, we begin, I just want to also request that if the audience has any questions, please enter them uh, by typing into the Q&A um, box. So I'll now introduce the, the four panel members. Um, I'll start with um, on your on the screen on the left is um, David Walkenfield from the Great Barrier 
Reef Marine Park Authority. So he's the chief scientist there. Um, Dr. Walkenfield has been a uh, director of Gabrumpa since 2003, uh, providing leadership in a diverse range of marine park management activities. He's also um, a really important partner investigator in the center and an adjunct professor professorial research fellow at the ARC Center and member of its scientific management committee. Um, Ove Ho Goldberg is deputy director of the ARC Center based at the University of Queensland. Ove's research focuses on the impacts of global change on marine ecosystems. He was one of the first scientists to identify the serious threat posed by climate change um, on coral reefs and was also um, a very important international role as coordinating the lead as coordinating lead author on the impact chapter of the IPCC special report on 1.5 degree warming. Um, Katarita Fabricius is a senior principal research scientist from the Australian Institute of Marine Science. Um, Katarita's research focuses on ecological processes in coral reefs and how to maximize their potential to recover from acute and chronic disturbances such as ocean acidification, poor water quality, and global warming. And her pioneering research has informed multiple national guidelines and international policies and practice, um, including water quality guidelines for the Great Barrier Reef. Finally, Associate Professor Mia Bugenboom um, is a co-leader of the pro Program 3 um, within the center based at James Cook University. Uh, Mia's research investigates how processes occurring at the physiological scale of reef organisms influence the growth, survival, and reproduction of coral reef associated organisms. She was a principal member of the National Coral Bleaching Task Force that you saw in that short film that documented um, mass bleaching events in the Great Barrier Reef in 2016, 2017, and 2020. Okay, so as I mentioned, please um, type your, your questions um, for the, the panel members, but I'll just, while you're entering those questions, I'll just start with a few um, questions for, for each of them. Um, so David, um, one question for you to start with is, what, what do you view as some of the most important functions for organizations like the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority when it comes to managing coral reef systems in this challenging state we're in with a warming climate? Thanks, Ryan, and, and welcome everybody. Look, I think that's a really important question. There's no doubt that climate change is changing the world and it's changing the Great Barrier Reef. It's changing the nature of managing a marine park like the Great Barrier Reef, and, and we have to adapt to the changing situation. I, I think probably uh, the simplest way to answer your question is, is to focus on three things that the Marine Park Authority has to do and is doing. So those three things are educate, innovate, and partner. Education, I think, is always part of a marine park manager's role, but with climate change, education becomes more important than ever before. We now have a global problem that is the biggest threat to the Great Barrier Reef. It requires a global solution, as we outlined in that, that great little video. And so the only possible way of delivering that global solution is to educate the global public about the need for strong mitigation and reduction of greenhouse gases. And I, I won't reiterate what I said in the film, but, you know, Gabrumba has a position statement about the strongest and fastest possible mitigation is needed. And we promote that message as much as we possibly can. The second thing on my list is innovate. So the world is changing, the reef is changing, we have to adapt our management and innovation is absolutely crucial. So we have had very strong innovation informed by some of the research out of the centre uh, to improve our crown of thorns starfish control program. The crown of thorns is a predator of coral, so it just adds to pressures on coral in addition to those from climate change. But the difference is the crown of thorns is the only pressure that we can tackle locally as marine park managers. So we're innovating in that space to do that ever better. We're innovating in terms of technology with our marine park management, more modern vessels, more modern technologies. This is very much on, on the back of the education for those who don't want to be educated about marine park management. We need a compliance and enforcement program to enforce the rules in the marine park to ensure its resilience and we're adapting and innovating in that space. 
And I completely agree with Terry that uh, contemporary restoration techniques are only viable at very full small scales. They're really about site stewardship, not about ecosystem management, but innovation in that space and research investment may deliver tools that we can use into the future. So we're partnering with the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program to uh, investigate that line of innovation to see what tools might be available to us more in the future. And then the third piece of my puzzle is partner. The Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority is the lead government agency for protection of the marine park, but the threats that face the marine park are now global and also coming from the catchment in terms of degraded water quality. We need to partner with scientists, with industry, with other government agencies and with the broader community to deliver solutions across all the various threats to the reef and improve its outlook for the future. And the uh, bleaching aerial surveys, I think, were a great example of that, of partnering with the centre, uh, with the centre undertaking that research and giving us that information. That was, a, that was a great, it's just one great example of partnership. But those, I think, Ryan, are the three things we really need to focus on in a changing world. Thanks, David. All right, so just, um, yeah, audience keep type, um, adding questions. Um, I'll just have a question for, for Ove. Um, so we've heard about the recent um, bleaching events and this in the severity, but um, did mass bleaching like this and mortality occur in the past? So there's a two part question. And how do we know that additional coral bleaching and mortality events are, are going to likely occur in the future like this? That's a really interesting question, Ryan. The, the incidence of, of um, studies sort of recording coral bleaching really sort of gets going in the, the early 1980s. And this is where you start to see sort of work done by people like Peter Glynn, the sort of legendary ecologist uh, working in the Eastern Pacific and, and in the Caribbean, and starting to sort of see the, the sort, of, sort of reports on, on this. Prior to that, um, there are no studies that I know of that sort of critically looked at the issue of, of coral bleaching and reported it. And so it's really interesting to ask the question, you know, why is that? You know, is this, uh, a case of um, it's there but nobody noticed it or it was the, it, it never happened in those sort of circumstances and so there's been a bit of a there was a, a debate early in the, um, the uh, sequence of ideas about the, maybe this was a natural phenomenon and it was going through cycles and so on and certainly prior to 1998 you know you could you could imagine a situation which is not sort of wiping things out but it's part of you know, you know temperature and light stress in the shallows and so on and so really, when you get to the 1980s and you start to see the sort of massive impacts that are affecting reefs, it becomes less and less, um, I think, viable that, 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 that they somehow did occurred in the past and, 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 not, and, not, and not seeing them today. So I think that's really where it is. I think it's, it happened. Um, places like the Low Isles have a few photographs from the 1928 expedition showing bleached uh, coral reefs, but they were nothing like what we're seeing today. Now, the question about what happens in the future is tied, I think, very much to some of the stuff that Terry was talking about, that there is a very strong linkage between temperature and bleaching and mortality. And so when you put all of that together and you look at those multiple lines of evidence, you get to a point where you get fairly good predictions about what's going to happen next on a reef if it experiences a fairly, um, you know, a, a strong temperature signal. And so when you look at that and you start to say, okay, well, what's going to happen to the you know, coral reefs in the future as we go into um, a, a fast warming world, it's uh, very credible that we're going to see more and more bleaching events until they stop simply because there's no more corals to bleach and kill. So I think there's a sort of, this is evidence-based science, building a picture uh, that I think we are now fairly certain about in terms of that, that future. That's why we have to really cut in emissions and really chart that, that new direction because you know, we're really facing the loss of one of the most significant ecosystems on the planet. And of course, this goes for many other ones as well if we don't get off the track we're at the moment. And just as a final point, a lot of politicians will say, well, we're doing stuff. But actually, if you take all of the um, policy uh, initiatives that people are, are planning to put into to play, this is very relevant coming into the Glasgow uh, COP uh, meeting. If you put all of those um, emission reduction in, intentions 
uh, into play, you still get a three degree warmer world that continues to get warmer. So we've got to do a lot more. Uh, and that's where science has an enormous role to play now in terms of convincing that political class that we can no longer do the things we've been doing, that it really is the chips are down and we must get off that, that track immediately. And that was echoed, I think, by uh, Terry and others. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Oak. Okay, I have a uh, this question um, for Katarina. So we've heard um, today a lot about the impacts of, of warming um, on coral reefs, but we've also you know, heard about um, other impacts of climate change and in, in discussions that come up, um, in particular, the role that ocean acidification may play when, when really fully understanding the, the future of coral reefs. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the role that ocean acidification plays. Um, you're on mute, Katarina. Can you hear me? No, can't. What about now? Yeah, what I can hear now? you now. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, thanks very much. Um, ocean acidification is the second sort of the evil twin of climate change. CO two is warming um, the atmosphere and the waters but it's also entering into the seawater and making the seawater more acidic. That CO2 in the seawater, it acts as a fuel for macroalgae. So it, it leads to greater growth of macroalgae on coral reefs. And macroalgae are really seaweed. They're competing with coral for space and are in coral reef environments, largely undesirable. The, the higher CO2 also leads to faster erosion of the carbonate substrates, substrata of the, in the reef, because sort of acid and lime don't go together. And so we're really concerned in a changing climate, we, in many places we are seeing greater storminess. So the reefs are withstanding greater wave energy and under ocean acidification may not be able to withstand and protect our coastal areas quite as well as in the past. And lastly, uh, um, the increased carbon dioxide is also very, very strongly affecting one particularly important type of algae. We call it crustus coralline algae, which are essential for coral babies to settle and recolonize areas. So these three forms of changes in, in coral reefs um, affecting the capacity of reefs to recover. So ocean acidification does not kill corals directly, but it does slow down the recovery. It makes it more difficult for coral reefs to recover after bleaching disturbances and so on. So I'm very concerned about ocean acidification. It's a global, it's insidious factor, and there's no latitudinal escape. Like corals um, and many organisms are moving to higher latitudes to escape the um, heat stress. That doesn't work for ocean acidification. So in many cases, it's a global issue. It's happening all around the world. It's happening in high latitudes, and it is largely irreversible at time scales of humans and um, tens of thousands of years. So what we are not emitting into atmosphere now will help coral reefs in 10,000 years. And, and that's something that we really got to keep in mind, these time perspectives. And, and how much we're really dealing with the future of, of coral reefs and many other ecosystems and human welfare as well. Good. Thanks a lot, Katarina. All right, a question for, for Mia. Um, so we've talked a bit about um, you know, the effects of coral um, global warming on, on coral bleaching, but what can people do to really slow down the incident and severity of uh, mass coral bleaching and mortality? Um, and also, just to sort of add on to that, what can we do at different scales? Like if we're thinking about more local effects, is there, is there stuff we can do to actually reduce the severity of coral bleaching? Uh, thank you, Ryan. Um, so as Terry and Ove have both mentioned, mass coral bleaching events are caused by, strongly associated with marine heat waves. So the best thing we can do to reduce the frequency and severity of bleaching and the mortality related to bleaching is to slow down global warming by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. However, corals are also negatively impacted by a range of other stressors. So temperature is not the only thing that's harmful for corals. If we have too much light limitation due to a lot of sediment in the water, oxygen depletion, if we get an unbalanced supply of nitrogen and phosphorus, 
changes in salinity, all of these additional stressors can make it harder for corals to recover from bleaching when it occurs. So at a global scale, we need to be taking action on climate change. At local scales, we can act to better manage um, water quality. We can do things like reducing pollution into the marine environment, changing our farming practices on land, better managing marine debris. There's a, a lot of things that individuals can also do to help corals survive bleaching events and to reduce those other stressors that also impact corals. Thanks, Maya. All right, so we have a question for um, David from Yolanda. It's an interesting question. Um, more about um, an organization like Abrumpa, which um, sits at this really challenging interface between um, you know, having access to the really good science, the immediate science, but also as a um, government agency where there's um, you know, challenges in terms of making sure um, you know, thinking about the, the political implications and so on of, of decisions. Um, how do you, you incorporate all of this knowledge and sort of balance those, those challenges when it comes to climate change and climate solutions? Almost forgot to unmute myself. Yeah. Look, it, it, climate change, there's no question, is a divisive subject uh, in Australian society. Um, there's, there's very strongly held opinions on either side of the debate, even if the science itself is not at all divided. And of, of course, you know, we operate in the public space. So the, the divisive nature of the subject, I think, is difficult. Um, it doesn't help moving forward. I, I said that one of the three things we need to focus on is education, and I think that's the key. Um, we just need to explain as much as possible what is actually happening on the reef, how climate change is driving that, what could go wrong if we don't do the right things around climate change, but equally what can go right if we do take the right path. And I think that's absolutely essential. So it's part of our role to try and make sure that whatever public debate there is, is as well informed uh, as it can be, and to try and bring as many people around to understanding the facts of the situation with climate change in the reef. Yeah, thanks, David. So this is a, a question from Amy and it was addressed to anyone, but maybe it seems closely, more closely related to Mia. Um, and it's this question about um, mesophotic coral reef ecosystems that um, mm -hmm. have been thought to be a potential deep reef refugia for, for corals going into the future. And I was just wondering um, what, if you have any opinions on the likelihood that deeper reefs could act as potential cedar for shallow reefs? Uh, that's an area of a lot of ongoing research actually between members of our center and many researchers around the world. So the notion is that um, Corals from ones from some species are present across a large depth range. So individual colonies from within a species in deeper water might escape bleaching and therefore be able to produce larvae that then go on to populate in shallower areas. Um, one issue to, that would prevent that happening is that a lot of the species we find in deeper locations aren't often actually found in shallow water. So many of those complex branching acroporas that we find in shallow water prefer shallow habitats and it's a different kind of suite of species that we see in deeper waters. So there's a lot of ongoing research about repopulation of shallow locations from some species with broad depth distributions, but there are also different species in those different habitats. So I think Ove's also done a bit of research on that topic. He might be able to add some more to that. Yeah, do you have any no, sorry, I, yes, the only thing I can add, I think is that the genetic studies that are done even within species are showing sort of highly structured, they're highly structured with depth. So a very different, you know, subtype will be, exist at, at 20 meters as at 10, as at five. And they, they aren't even immediately swappable because there's very different conditions in the, the shallows for very many other reasons, as opposed to just sort of that um, depth gradient and so on. I mean, it's also really interesting from the perspective of um, these refugia uh, avoiding the damage of cyclones. And, that is also another sort of factor 
Although it's been pointed out that those those regions being affected by you know cyclones and so on are, are relatively small relative to the sort of population and, and, and impact that you'd, you'd want. Yeah, All right, so we have Ryan, a yes. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, David. Sorry, can I just just add something there? I, I think um, you know both storm or cyclone damage and damage from marine heat waves do attenuate with depth, and so people often say oh, but it's only the shallow reefs, you know, deeper, it's not that bad. And, and that's an attempt to downplay the importance of these impacts. But I think what, what people have to remember is that the overwhelming majority of the value that humans get from coral reefs is in the shallow areas. Um, they're more diverse, they're more productive. We don't take tourists down to 50 or 60 meters to show them mesophotic reefs. We drive them around in glass bottom boats and we, we send them snorkeling to look at the top five meters of the reef. Um, even the most valuable part of commercial fishing on the reef is the export of live coral trout. You can't catch coral trout from depth and keep them alive to export them. So that fishery relies on healthy shallow reef habitat. So it's not just about attenuation of impact with depth. And, and what that means for the future of coral reefs. But we need to remember where humans, and I'm talking about hundreds of millions of humans around the world, get their value. And it's from the shallow reef systems that are those that are most exposed to the impacts from climate change. And I, I think people need to keep that in mind when they think about those things. And we got to also remember that um, corals in the deeper waters grow very slowly. That means the impacts that are happening down there are probably setting back the communities by 50 years instead of by 12 or 15. And certain impacts like water quality are even worse in the deeper areas because light attenuation means down there it's get really getting dark if the water gets turbid and uh, sediments accumulate for more easily in the deeper areas because there's no ray-free suspension. Ocean acidification affects the deeper waters as well as the shallow waters. So the deeper areas are not an um, escape for coral reefs in the longer term. Okay, thanks. Um, a question from Henry um, for, for Ove, and this is actually quite an interesting question. Um, you know, we hear a lot about bleaching in the Great Barrier Reef and Terry's talk really, you know, highlighted the, the incredible data that has been collected um, by Center and, and its partners. Um, but is there anything sort of unique about the Great Barrier Reef compared to, um, you know, other parts, say the Coral Triangle, where, you know, we don't hear as much about in terms of bleaching impacts? Is it just because we're collecting more data and we have more, you know, research devoted to places like the Great Barrier Reef? Or is there something peculiar about the GBR? I think, I think it's probably both. Um, there, there are regional differences in the sensitivity of corals. Well, I should say the exposure and, and, and seeming sensitivity of corals to thermal stress. And so recently I was talking to people working in the Bird's Head, the Raja Ampat site in Indonesia, who, who said that um, uh, they'd only seen bleaching in 2020 and before that, you know, there's the, no records of bleaching now. Uh, when you look at things like the rate of temperature change, some parts of the sort of heart of the coral triangle are not changing that rapidly, that they're actually more slowly, uh, they're, they're undergoing a sort of a, um, a rate of heating that's, that's less than um, that average globally. So there are these sort of regional differences. We're quite interested in those because they uh, potentially represent opportunities for targeted conservation. I mean, if you've got an area where things are not changing as quickly and you're able to sort of to deploy or to protect from other stresses that are not climate related for it per se, these things become quite useful. And so that's this idea of, of uh, having a portfolio of reef systems across the planet that, that have um, that are warming at a, a slower rate than, than elsewhere and protecting them from pollution, you know, overfishing and so on. So that's a very, very interesting question you've asked there. And I think it's a work in progress. I think so. All right, so I just had, um, just noticed the time. So um, we've reached the, the, the time we had allotted. So um, just wanna really thank the panel members for the very stimulating discussion, some interesting topics um, were discussed.
So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a short break um, and return in about 10 minutes um, for the second half of the symposium. So thanks again to the panelists and thanks for the audience for, for, for listening. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan.
millions of people around the world uh, rely on coral reefs for marine resources. They're important for um, nutrition and they're a major protein source in especially developing island nations. The IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, has a goal to protect 30% um, of all habitats in the ocean by 2030 in marine reserves. When the centre was first established in 2005, we knew that if you set up an individual reserve, that we'd start to see a bigger sort of biomass of fish inside these protected areas. The big question that everybody wanted to know back then was, you know, to what extent is the breeding that's going on in reserves benefiting the adjacent fisheries? We've learnt an enormous amount about the potential for marine reserves, not just as conservation tools, but as fisheries management tools. That's been mostly due to great breakthroughs in tagging and tracking marine larvae, fish larvae. The study done in 2006 to 2009 uh, in the Keppel Islands was a major, major breakthrough. They were one of the first studies in the world to show absolutely and utterly unequivocally that larvae of targeted fish went from areas closed to fishing out to areas open to fishing by larval dispersal. And they did that with genetic technique called parentage analysis. The beauty of genetic parentage analysis is that if you can find a juvenile fish on the reef, you can sample its parents, you know exactly where it's come from and uh, what distance, what direction. When I was growing up as a student, this was the holy grail, this was the, the thing that we all thought we might never know. When Jeff Jones first showed me the, the initial results from the Keppel Island study, a map with lines going all over the place, you know, that, that, that was just mind-boggling to see that sort of stuff. I never thought I'd see data like that in my lifetime. It was a major, major breakthrough in marine reserves being used as a fisheries management tool, not just on the Great Barrier Reef, but globally. When we applied DNA parentage analysis to this region where we're working, we were able to show that well-managed marine protected areas like Apo Island could support or enhance uh, fisheries. That evidence that the center helped uh, to produce is very crucial in supporting the efforts to, to establish marine protected area networks in the Philippines. To this day, I still show those results to sell the idea that we should be forming marine protected area networks. It's every manager's dream to be able to show, for example, that zoning and no-take areas benefit both the environment and the people that, that rely on the reef. And research coming out of the, of the centre has helped us show exactly that. You know, the spillover of fish from no-take zones to zones open to fishing. Um, has been amazing not only to show that our management is effective but also communicating the benefits of, of zoning to users of the marine park. So we have green zones where um, fishing is prohibited, we have blue zones where fishing is the least limited and yellow zones are really interesting because they sort of sit in this intermediate space. So fishing is not prohibited but it is limited and the way that that happens is by limitations on the amount and the type of fishing gear that can be used. There is a reduction from fishing in the numbers of those primary targets in those yellow zones, but we still see really healthy numbers and the biodiversity and the overall ecosystem structure is similar between the two zones. And that's important because it indicates that these effects of fishing, some of those predatory fishes, are not cascading down the food chain. Yellow zones do have a great capacity to support conservation goals, especially when they are located in areas with lots of green zones as well. Ecologists are specialists in their field. They dedicate their time to you know, really understanding how things work and how systems work. Having well-trained staff from the centre um, that are so accessible and embedded in our management is critical. Working with the centre allows us to harness that information and cutting edge research so that we are at the forefront of management.
Welcome back to the symposium. I hope you enjoyed our short film on marine reserves. It's my pleasure now to introduce you to our second plenary speaker, Professor John Pandolfi. John, can you please turn on your camera and your microphone and share your screen? John is from the University of Queensland and is co-leader of Research Program 2 with myself and Graham. He is the world's leading expert on coral reef paleoecology and the effects of anthropogenic impacts and climate change on the recent past history of modern coral reefs. John is a former president of the Australian Coral Reef Society and is a fellow of both the International Coral Reef Society and the Paleontological Society. And if you have a question for John, please just type it in using the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and I'll ask it for you at the end of his presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, John, are you ready to go? Yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you good and the slides look great. Okay, thank you, Alana. Well, what a great film showing just how marine reserves have been a striking feature of the ARC Center of Excellence since its inception from the early work of Gary Russ in the Philippines extending right through the center's history. Well, 16 years ago, this ARC center was established, but its roots go back even further when Terry set up a fully functional pre-ARC center, the Center for Coral Reef Biodiversity at JCU in 2001. In my talk today, I'm going to focus on three issues, the foundational work that led to the form formulation of the center, 15 years of center research, and the challenges that lie ahead. Now the issues and examples I'll cover are by no means exhaustive, and they mostly represent influences on my own relationship with the center and with coral reef science, or they're illustrative of broader issue, issues. So please permit me to ramble on from a very personal perspective. From the mid late 1990s to, mid, to the mid 2000s, the JCU Center came into being against the backdrop of some very important work that was going on at the time. I've organized this work into four primary headings shown here. The influential, this influential and important work also led to the form formulation of the subsequently funded ARC Center of Excellence. We'll go through these four issues briefly now. The first topic was the maintenance of species diversity on coral reefs. Joe Connell's 30 years of work on Heron Island reefs was published in the late 90s with Terry and Cardin Wallace. This work showed on yearly to decadal scales, dramatic fluctuations in coral species abundances and cover through time and space. And the conclusion was that reefs are disturbance driven systems that never reach an equilibrium state. About the same time, Hubble's unified neutral theory of biodiversity and biogeography was being worked on and formulated and published. It explained species distributions as the consequence of chance variation in birth, death, migration, and speciation events among demographically and competitively equivalent species. Stemming from a symposium that I co-organized at the 1998 ICRS Symposium in Panama, Hubble applied his neutral theory to coral reefs with a paper that subsequently appeared in the journal Coral Reefs. Now, long-term records from the Pleistocene fossil record of Papua New Guinea showed contrasting patterns to these more stochastic sorts of um, issues and showed remarkable persistence and the potential for determinism in community assembly. I found greater spatial than temporal variability over a 95,000 year interval in the fossil reef terraces of the Huon Peninsula in Papua New Guinea. The anasim showed no significant difference among times in community composition through time and a null model showed that the species composition was not a random draw from the species pool. And there are also no significant difference in species richness through time. So could it be that community assembly was more deterministic with species biotic and abiotic niche axes? Well, in 2003, along came the classic text by Chase and Leibold, which led to a whole body of literature which focuses on potential niche explanations of patterns not explained by a handful of demographic stochastic processes or disturbance-driven non-equilibrial dynamics. Moving on now to the next issue, I believe was, was foundational back in, that, back in the day, and that is understanding the effects of human disturbance on coral reef ecosystems. Both climate and non-climate drivers of reef degradation were becoming more and more chronicled in the years prior to the first ARC center. 
The approach that opened up my eyes the most to this devastation was that of historical ecology. And of course, Jeremy Jackson's classic paper on historical overfishing and global marine ecosystems. Here, people move to the top of the food web with devastating and cascading impacts throughout marine communities. We follow this work up a few years later with a more in-depth study of coral reefs and found early and plentiful human impacts that occurred well before effects of climate change with loss of corals following loss at higher trophic levels. At the same time, O was, had begun his important work trying to understand the effects of heat waves on bleaching frequency and intensity and forecasting mass bleaching events through 2100. The JCU Center also focused on these topics, providing additional nuance in forecasting that took into account species and location differences and the potential role for acclimation and adaptation. Also occurring at this time, was an emerging commitment to scientific advocacy and societal engagement in the ecological sciences, with a flurry of papers, particularly in bioscience, conservation biology, and the opinion pages of science and nature. Important questions were being debated at this time, including the role of scientists in environmental advocacy, how the integrity of scientists could be impacted by advocacy, and the role of scientists in policy formation. And then lastly occurring at this time was renewed thinking on managing marine ecosystems that helped to set the stage for marine reserves approaches to coral reef management. And as we saw in the film, Gary Russ and Angel Alcala's early work in the Philippines showed the overwhelmingly positive effects of marine reserves on fish number and diversity. And Jeff Jones's work, seminal work on natal larval retention gained enormous attention and both were used as justification for the rezoning of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park in 2003-2004. Important management strategies were being bandied about at this time as well. The magic 30% number is a minimum for no take areas for marine reserves, as of course was adopted for the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. These principles also guided the decision for the huge Papuhanao Mokuakea Monument in the Northern Hawaiian Islands in 2006 setting aside 140,000 square miles for protection, which has since been increased to over 500,000 square miles. Fast forward now, and I want to briefly highlight some research directions the center has gone during its 15 years of work. While the center didn't start out this way, we're gonna focus on the current programmatic structure, which includes people and ecosystems, ecosystem dynamics, and responding to a changing world. Of course, it's simply not possible to chronicle the myriad achievements of the center in just a few minutes, and I'm not going to try. I won't even claim that the papers I highlight are the shining major successes. My intention is just to give a flavor for the diversity and scope of center research. In fact, the center started out with five programs, not three, and, all, and at one point grew to eight programs during its first iteration before finally settling down to its current programmatic structure at the start of the second funding cycle. And we'll, we'll look at these each in turn. Firstly, turning to people and ecosystems. The Rockstrom et al. 2009 paper delineated planetary boundaries for a number of Earth's depleting systems. For three of these, the planetary boundaries have already been exceeded. The rate of biodiversity loss, climate change, and human interference with a nitrogen cycle. Studies such as this provide a way to reflect on our relationships with nature on a grand scale and open our eyes to the magnitude of change humans are inflicting on our world. Tiffany provided an analytic history of GBR reef governance since the inception of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. The governance structure remained relatively stable over time, but the effectiveness of governance has varied and depleted through time. Awareness of governance structure and its effectiveness has important general implications at multiple governance levels. And Josh and Michelle have evaluated the social dimensions of reef resilience, finding a suite of proximal and distal drivers that affect ecosystem health, ecosystem goods and services, and human well being. The adaptive capacity to alter resilience lies at a number of human enterprises and characteristics. Moving to program two, ecosystem dynamics, past, present, and future, 
I highlight here Nick Graham's 2015 paper, which found that climate-driven regime shifts and recovery from stress depended on a few key ecosystem attributes, such as the initial 3D structural com complexity of the reef and depth of water. And by looking at just the relationship of just these two variables, one could predict relative susceptibility to recovery after disturbance. This empirical study and others from the center like it show how ecosystem dynamics can be predicted against the backdrop of environmental change. And Jez Roth et al. documented the, the decline of coastal Queensland apex predator popula populations over the past 50 years. This work is highly consistent with the massive depletions of Spanish mackerel and pink snapper documented by Ruth Thurston and Sarah Buckley from historical records along the Queensland coastline. Don't let every, anyone, don't ever let anyone tell you that the Great Barrier Reef hasn't been exploited by fisheries. And now to program three, responding to a changing world. And I highlight here a recent paper by Sophie Dove. Her group completed a 12 month mesocosm experiment of reefs grown in different warming and PCO2 conditions. They found a decoupling of calcifier biomass and calcification under the synergistic impact of warming and acidification that combined with increased nighttime dissolution led to an accelerated loss of carbonate frameworks. The study concluded that reefs are at risk of drowning as sea level rises. These are critical studies that bridge the gap between lab-based experimental work and field surveys. And they're particularly important as they incorporate multiple stressors. And finally, two recent papers in science advances explore the impacts of a changing world. The first involving COE's Jody Rummer and Phil, Phil Monday with colleagues who showed physiological and genetic consequences of heat waves in wild fish populations. While Dave Miller and Mad Madeline Van Oppen and colleagues have shown coral host genomic signatures reflect much older Pleistocene divergence, whereas photosymbiote differences reflect contemporary conditions. Such molecular studies illustrate the great strength in understanding molecular features for interpreting future impacts from climate change. Of course, there are all sorts of wonderful papers produced by the center I've, I've ignored. What was it, 4,000 of them? But we need to move on. The scope and magnitude of research endeavors has been truly astonishing over the past 16 years of, a, of our ARC Center of Excellence. And of course, I have no time to dwell today on the equally inspiring commitment to training and mentorship. And now with a few minutes remaining, let's ponder some of the challenges ahead. What should we be doing now? And again, this is not meant to be an exhaustive list of all the pressing challenges facing coral reef science and management, but rather my own personal reflection of directions that I think need particular focus. In his Wicked Problems paper on the South China Sea, Terry put the challenge for ocean management succinctly, I think, when he said that we need changes in policy and legal frameworks, refinement of government structures, and cooperation among neighboring countries if we're going to develop a cooperative management for coral reefs. Following in this vein, the Blue Parks Initiative from the Marine Conservation Institute seeks exp expansion of 30% no-take reserves and their global integration. And I think this is an important initiative that embodies what our challenges really remain for ocean management. Our next challenge is to ensure our pathways to impact. And here, we need to engage indigenous communities from the outset to a process of knowledge co-production. Here's an example from the indigenous outback communities from Central Australia, where of course one player is larger in mass and power than the other, shown here by the differences in the size of the boxes. In this relationship, complex and contested histories of nation state colonization can increase vulnerability. So interactions between the two must be carefully managed to achieve a fully integrated and co-productive co framework. But roadmaps exist and there are developing norms to meet this challenge. We also need to make ourselves heard. And indeed we are doing this from a number of uh, institutional perspectives, but we're up against a lot of voices out that can carry outsized weight. 
like Anthea Bailey here. She's not sure what planet we're on, but hers is certainly hasn't been getting worse. Her coral reefs are doing fine, her Antarctic or ice is fine, and her polar bears are fine. Fires are caused by arsonists. Greens are leading the world up the garden path. And much of it has to do with plastics, but you can't change natural climate. This is social media at its, at its best, a deafening source of misinformation unbounded by factual basis. And it's often maintained by disruptive and powerful forces. But our challenge is to increase public awareness of wicked problems associated with coral reefs. And we need to meet this challenge head on. Next, how do we optimize our scientific effort? We're still lacking in some basic fundamental knowledge. How do we navigate the fine line between panda bear science for public awareness and the critical need for fundamental and applied advances? As was pointed out in the, in the panel session, we have a number of highly touted transformative technologies, any one of which might improve reefs locally or over the short term, but probably very few that are scalable and may never will be. And how do we plan for an uncertain future? We require a highly predictive capacity, a capacity that incorporates people, but we need to differentiate between ecosystem disappearance and ecosystem change through emerging ecological novelty. Governance is needed at multiple levels and foundationally at the indigenous level, incorporating the indigenous level. We need to strengthen political will and enact appropriate governments. Unfortunately, too many of the rich and powerful are coming to what I call the screeching out the back door syndrome. The house is on fire. What do we do to grab as fast as, and as much as we can? And what happens is there's poor enforcement. So I can remember in 2019 when Adani was fined $13,000 for a cold slurry spill. In 2017, their revenue was what, almost $11.4 billion. So the fine was some minuscule percentage of their income. For someone making $100,000 a year in Australia, the equivalent fine would have been 0.12 cents. This is not proper governance. How do our positive efforts and results in changing things stack up to the negative forces working against progress? We need good news stories. We have good news stories. They provide hope. We can't rely on ecological grief and eco-anxiety to get us through. It won't. We need to maintain hope and to provide concrete evidence that hope is worth sustaining. Now, adhering to strong principles of self-governance is also important, getting our own house in order. So for our self-governance, we need to live up to the principles of JEDI, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I'm pleased and proud to say that we have begun this work already in the current center of excellence. So, Looking forward now to the three major programs that will make up our future center, capturing change, clarifying choices, and co-creating just and equitable futures. I just wanna say all of these issues are bound up in our future that I think is very bright indeed. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, John. That was uh, incredibly inspirational talk. And it was great to hear the history of the centre put so eloquently with fantastic examples from across our three programs. If you have any questions for John, please see the Q&A function. We have time for about one question, I think, and nothing's popped up yet. So I'm gonna ask a question to you, John, given the context you've just provided us and that we have some ECRs and PhD students coming on later to have a talk about the future of coral reef research. What would be your number one piece of advice that you'd give to someone starting out in coral reef science today? Well, that's a wonderful question. I, I, I guess I give that advice uh, all the time to my own students. Um, <laughs> and, and, and that is stay in the game, work hard, commit yourself. Um, the, the things that you're doing now may seem small and incremental, uh, but they're really building the foundation for a better future. And I would just, try to get as many skills as possible, quantitative skills. The management skills will come for you, those interested in ecology. Um, maintain that focus on your scientific uh, skills. And then we need those to, 
come across over into the management sphere. So keep those managers informed. And I guess also to co-produce your research with the, with the stakeholders. Um, don't do it at a later date, incorporate them now. That's a great way to end this session. Thank you so much, John, because up next now we actually have a short film on the incentives, uh, on the centre's impactful partnerships and the research that we've done on the social dimensions of coral reefs. Thanks, John. Thanks, Alana. It's absolutely a global network. I mean, there's almost there's almost no area of coral reef that we don't have some sort of connection to. We've got sort of institutional partnerships, groups like World Fish and the Wildlife Conservation Society. And then we've also got former students of ours that are now uh, in government agencies or NGOs or in research institutes of their own. So the Centre of Excellence is a really strong partner, obviously. We work together on how to manage coral reef fisheries in collaborative ways. The Centre is a provider of excellent research. It's cutting edge, it's independent, it's sometimes a bird's eye view of what's happening and it allows us to critically reflect on where we're at, where we're going and how to improve. You, you need institutions like WorldFish who are really engaged with implementing the, the, the research. And so we have this sort of two-way partnership where we can raise the level of science that's being done, but they can also raise our ability to have impact on the ground. And then we've also got community partnerships where we've got communities that we've been working directly with. I've been doing research in fishing communities um, since the late 1990s, going back to the same villages for over 20 years. So we were able to track the changes over time and understand how management had been changing and what that means for the environment. That's something that you can't get from just taking a snapshot approach to doing research. That can only be done uh, with long-term funding like we've had. We've been studying shocks and surprises in coastal communities for a very long time to try to understand how to build resilience to change, but COVID-19 was a completely different ballgame. When COVID hit, we started to wonder what was happening in the communities we work with for a long time because they are quite dependent on their coral reefs and quite vulnerable to shocks like this. We started developing some interviews that could be done over the phone. We followed up with them. Uh, every few months to see what had changed in terms of the COVID restrictions that were in place and how they were coping with those disruptions. Fishers that we work with in Papua New Guinea and Kenya were completely cut off from markets and so they were unable to sell fish, they were unable to get food to feed their families. Because now you can't go out and fish at night because of the nighttime curfew, then uh, it becomes very difficult for them to, uh, to continue uh, fishing. There was also the cessation of movement, so they couldn't really find a place where they could sell their fish. This project really came about through the connections that the centre already had with these places. We couldn't have done this research without having worked in those communities, but also being connected to people on the ground. Researchers from the ARC uh, Centre of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies have also supported uh, this project financially. So they have mobilised resources and uh, we are able to make it a long-term study rather than a one-off study. The range of different measures that were put in place by governments, as well as the impact of having to cope with a disease itself, meant that lots of different parts of food systems and other aspects of life were affected all at the same time. Things related to climate change can also cause these cascading, multiple simultaneous effects. We might be able to take lessons from how COVID has changed communities and how people are dealing with that to move forward to look at how people can adapt to the multiple effects of climate change. We've done research on climate change adaptation in a Papua New Guinean island atoll where they're on the front lines of climate change. And we found that households that had connections with other households that had undertaken some sort of adaptive response to climate impacts were more likely to have done so as well. There's sort of this social influence effect going on through people's social connections.
Currently, many adaptation programs across the globe are focusing on building assets. So these are things like building infrastructure or savings. What our research shows is that a broader set of factors play a role. Things like learning, social networks, and even power dynamics. So our research can inform better policies and programs that can potentially help to build more resilient coastal communities in the future that are better able to respond to climate change and other shocks like COVID-19. It's now, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michelle Barnes, who is just featured in that video, excellent video. Michelle, uh, you've got your camera and mic on, looking great. Just share your screen when you're ready, looks fantastic. Michelle Thanks. is a DECRA and Senior Research Fellow at James Cook University and Co-Chair of our Centre's Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. She's an environmental social scientist who works, draws on theories and methods from socio-ecology and economics to better understand the linkages between people and ecosystems that underpin complex environmental problems. She's previously been awarded a USA NSF Research Fellowship and is a Queensland Young Tool Poppy and currently serves on the board of the Australian Network for Social Network Analysis. If you have any questions for Michelle, please type them in using the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and I will moderate them at the end of Michelle's talk. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Anna. I'm gonna to start today with a story about Aarhus Islands in Papua New Guinea. Aarhus is home to a fishing community of about 700 people that are highly dependent on reefs for food and income. In their words, in the past, our ancestors lived an untroubled life and were very happy. They had many resources, caught many fish, and food was abundant. Temperatures are not like in the past. When it is sunny and we go to the reef at low tide, you can feel the sea is so hot and you can see the reef is dying. The sea has destroyed everything along the shoreline. In the past, we would catch many fish, but today fish are further out and we have to go far to find them. Unfortunately, this story is a common one. Coral reefs support millions of people worldwide Yet reefs are experiencing unprecedented changes that threaten their livelihoods and well being. This poses several critical questions. How are people adapting to these changes? What's helped them? What's standing in their way? And how can we help places like Aarhus and coastal communities around the world that depend on reefs? Today, I'm going to share with you a legacy of groundbreaking research conducted by scholars based at and affiliated with our research center that provides some answers to these questions. But first, why should you care? Social scientists tend to care about whether and how people are adapting to changes because the focus of our work is the livelihoods and well being of people. But even if you care more about the environment than you do people, you should care too because how people respond to environmental change can have direct consequences on the environment. Indeed, over 10 years ago, social scientists from our center showed that in response to severe declines in reef fish catch, Tanzanian fishers were more likely to respond in ways that amplified the decline, for example, by fishing harder, which can worsen conditions in reefs, rather than using dampening adaptations, such as reducing effort. But people can also respond in ways that support more sustainable futures, for example, by actively campaigning, engaging in alternative livelihoods, and through ecosystem stewardship. So how can we better support these types of responses? In other words, how can we help? This brings us back to our first two critical questions, which will form the primary focus of my talk today, because in order for us to know how we can help, we first need to know whether and how people are adapting to changes in reefs and what's helping or hindering them along the way. Now, whether and how people respond to environmental change is widely recognized to be driven by their adaptive capacity, broadly defined as the underlying conditions that enable people to anticipate and respond to change, to minimize the consequences, to recover, and to take advantages of new opportunities. Now, if even after I read that definition, you're not exactly sure what adaptive capacity is, you're not alone. 
Adaptive capacity has been a particularly nebulous concept that has been really hard to pin down, never mind to operationalize. Now, this has been due in part to the fact that it has been widely written about across multiple social science disciplines that sometimes, oddly enough, don't talk to each other very well. Now, in 2015, our People and Ecosystems group organized a workshop that brought together some of the greatest minds that have been thinking about and using this concept in the context of the environment in order to synthesize all these different strands of literature and enable this concept to be more broadly applied. Now, among all the wine tasting and trying out for the tropical sand sledding team, I can confirm that at least some work was done as evidenced by the perspective that we published in Nature Climate Change shortly thereafter that provided a framework for understanding the different domains or, or dimensions of adaptive capacity. So what exactly are these domains? So in the framework, we discuss how assets have long been identified as key for building adaptive capacity, right? So if people have money, they can afford to make changes. Yet adaptive behavior can also be driven by whether people have the flexibility to change strategies, for example, to move between livelihoods and the power or agency to influence change or to make their own free choices in determining whether to change or not. Adaptive behavior can also be influenced by the relationships binding people to each other and the environment, right? These relationships shape processes of social influence and can determine whether and how people access the information, resources, and support needed to adapt. They also shape the context in which people learn to recognize change and absorb, process, and synthesize information in order to sort of plan for uncertainties and adapt to shocks. Now, in a more recent paper, we built on this framework by drawing on research in psychology to emphasize that socio-cognitive constructs such as risk attitudes and cognitive biases can also play an important role in people's adaptive behavior, right? For example, if someone doesn't perceive a risk from climate change, they're highly unlikely to adapt to it. So this collaborative research contributed a much better understanding of adaptive capacity. Yet one thing that became very clear from this synthesis work was that most of the research on adaptive capacity had focused on only one or two of these domains. And empirical research had often relied on looking at hypothetical responses to hypothetical scenarios, right? So we actually still lacked explicit empirical evidence demonstrating how these diverse domains of adaptive capacity simultaneously underpin adaptive action. So I wanted to begin filling this gap, but I knew it was going to require a lot of data and expertise, right? So much more than any one researcher would reasonably be able to acquire by themselves. So in December 2018, I organized a second workshop comprised of center students, researchers, and collaborators from across the social and ecological sciences to empirically test the role of these different domains of adaptive capacity on responses to climate change. So we focused this effort on Aarhus, the small island fishing community in Papua New Guinea that I introduced in the beginning of my talk. Now researchers at our center have a really long history of collaborative interdisciplinary research in this community. So drawing on this diverse expertise and the experience of our team, we were able to integrate data from a full population census, summary structured social surveys, key informant and expert interviews, observed fish landings, and published reports to document adaptive behaviors and capture all those different domains of adaptive capacity. Now, in looking at the adaptive behaviors, we classified them in two ways, adaptive and or transformative. Now, I first wanna say that we're still definitely trying to parse out how to determine when a response to change might be considered transformative in nature um, rather than adaptive. Now, acknowledging that, we followed recent work in classifying adaptive action as minor to moderate adjustments to existing practices and behaviors, All right? So following this definition, in our case, adaptive actions included things like building a seawall to deal with coastal inundation, which I've pictured here, or changing fishing practices to deal with declines and catch. Now we define transformative action as more fundamental changes that can alter dominant social ecological relationships and aid in creating sort of a new system or future. Now in our case, an action was considered transformative if the household had diversified their livelihood approach by becoming engaged in the toll farming, which represented a fundamentally new livelihood approach in our study site that had only just been evolving over the past few years. 
um, which I've pictured here, or if they had been engaged sort of in developing more long-term plans for the community, such as resettlement schemes. Now we developed 20 key indicators representing the six broad domains of adaptive capacity. So these included social and economic characteristics such as wealth and risk perceptions, but they also included a household's position in a complex social ecological network, which we use to capture aspects of organization and learning. Now, I don't have time to go over all the different indicators that we used in detail, but I do wanna take a minute to explain the idea of this social ecological network. So this idea rests on the notion that people often have strong connections with each other, and these social relationships can influence attitudes and beliefs. And this can be thought of sort of as a network exposure effect. Now, in addition to these social relationships, people also often have strong connections with the environment, for example, with specific resources or groups of resources, which themselves are often interconnected. Right, so these social ecological relationships can be important for several reasons. For example, they can facilitate learning about climate induced changes in the ecological environment. So using a specialized network model, we were able to predict adaptive and transformative actions as a function of a household's adaptive capacity while accounting for their position in this complex multi-level social ecological network. So what did we find? First, only half of all households had undertaken any sort of action in response to climate change. So what enabled those that did? So here, everything in white with a star was significant for predicting adaptive action in our model, and everything in yellow with a star was significant for both adaptive and transformative action in our models. Interestingly, we found none of our indicators of assets or flexibility were significantly related to any of our studied responses, whereas organization, sociocognitive factors, agency, and learning were all important to some extent. Now, this is a critical result on its own because currently, adaptive capacity programs are spending a lot of money on building up things like um, uh, agency, or sorry, assets and flexibility. <clears throat> now, we also found some really interesting results regarding social networks and power. Now, we tested different aspects of social networks, such as people's position in the network and whether they had ties to external actors. And the only thing that we found to be important in this case was actually network exposure, which was positively significant for predicting both adaptive and transformative action. Okay, so what this essentially means is that if my household had social ties to a household that had engaged in some sort of adaptive or transformative action, my household was more likely to as well. Perceived influence or power was also important for both responses, but this was the only instance in which we found the effects to actually be at odds with each other. Right, so specifically, when a household felt that they had power to influence the management of marine resources, they were more likely to have taken some sort of adaptive measure in light of climate change impacts, but significantly less likely to have engaged in more transformative action. Why might this be? Well, we believe that there are two potential explanations. First, and maybe that people that feel that they have power over decisions about marine resources don't feel the need to transform, right? Because they can sort of control what's going on. A second potential, potential explanation, which aligns with emerging research by other scholars, is that powerful actors may potentially be working against transformations because these types of societal shifts can undermine or threaten their power, which is established in the current system. Now, if powerful interests blocking systemic change sounds oddly familiar, it's probably because it is. Now, interestingly, we also found that power played a disproportionate role on the adaptive behavior of households with less exposure to others who had taken action in response to climate change. Let me explain that using adaptive action as an example. Okay, so here we plotted differences in the probability of taking adaptive action on the y-axis, depending on the number of network contacts a household has that is also engaged in adaptive action on the x-axis. So there are two different lines on the graph which correspond to the level of perceived power or influence that a household has over decisions about marine resource management. Moderate to high influence is shown in light blue and little to no influence is shown in dark blue. And the shaded regions represent 95% confidence intervals. Okay, 
So what this essentially shows us is that first, everything else being equal, if my household was not exposed to anyone who had adapted and we had little or no power over decisions about marine resources, there was a very low probability that we would have, we would have adapted, right? Almost none. By comparison, that probability was about 20% for those with moderate to high power. However, going back to this example of my household with little to no power, indicated by the red dot on the graph, if we were exposed to several other households who had adapted, say four, our probability of adapting would have been more or less equivalent to that of powerful households with no network partners taking action. So in summary, the role that power plays becomes less important as we are exposed to more and more people undertaking change. So going back to our questions from the beginning of the talk, in this example, people adapted to changes in reefs through a range of actions like adapting fishing practices to making more fundamental adjustments, such as engaging in entirely new livelihoods and aspects of social organization, agency, learning, and sociocognitive factors were all critically important determinants of these actions. Right, so these findings have important implications because again, adaptive capacity building programs are currently spending millions of dollars worldwide trying to build up things like assets and flexibility in an attempt to enable people to better deal with change. Right, so our results suggest that these programs could significantly benefit from expanding their focus to include these other sort of less obvious domains of adaptive capacity. Now, though this was the first study to empirically test how different domains of adaptive capacity relate to adaptive action, it was certainly not the last. Indeed, this legacy of research has spurred a flurry of scholarship. For example, our adaptive capacity framework is being used to understand how we can support climate adaptation in coastal communities around the world by the Ocean Modeling Forum, a partnership focused on real world impact that's spearheaded by the University of Washington and includes a diverse range of organizations and scholars from around the world. One of our postdocs co-funded with WorldFish has also been involved in related work that draws on the adaptive capacity framework that we developed to provide recommendations for operationalizing climate change resilience in fisheries. So this was part of a SNAP working group, which also includes researchers and practitioners from around the world. Our researchers and partners at WorldFish have also drawn on our framework to understand how fishers and fishery supply chains are being disrupted by COVID and the role of gender in determining how people have been able to respond to these changes. As is common, our students are pushing the frontier even further, asking critical questions such as how do interactions between domains work to influence people's ability to respond to shocks such as the dramatic impacts that COVID has had on food security? And does the type of shock matter in terms of which domain of adaptive capacity is most critical for enabling responses? Preliminary evidence looking at responses to COVID versus coral bleaching among tourism operators suggests that it does. So we're getting closer and closer to understanding how people are adapting to changes in reefs and the factors that influence those responses. But there's still a lot of work to do, especially in answering this last question, how can we help? I see two critical gaps that we need to overcome. The first relates to the weakest link hypothesis, which argues that adaptive capacity will ultimately be determined by the weakest of its underlying dimensions, suggesting that there's limited substitutability between domains of adaptive capacity. Now in practice, this would mean that we could waste all the money in the world on bolstering assets and flexibility, and it would have no impact whatsoever if, for example, people didn't have the agency to mobilize it. Though critically important, this idea has not been explicitly tested considering all six domains of adaptive capacity. We have some preliminary evidence that I shared with you today which showed that although it was key for influencing responses, a lack of agency could potentially be overcome through exposure to others undertaking change. So this would suggest that there's some level of substitutability between agency and social organization. But would this also be the case in other settings and at other scales or levels? Does context matter? Does it matter how agency was measured and operationalized? Or is another domain of adaptive capacity potentially the weakest link? right, like sociocognitive factors. These are critical questions that at present we don't have answers for, yet we urgently need them if we're gonna figure out how to effectively build adaptive capacity. Another critical research frontier 
is what types of responses exactly should we be aiming to support? Now, this is a critically important question because as we discussed at the beginning of the talk, not all adaptations are necessarily going to be desirable in terms of how they influence ecological and or social outcomes. So we need to understand where we wanna go and find a way to get there. To do this, we need to know how people affected by changes in reefs envision alternative futures and work across disciplinary lines to find out where these visions merge with conservation and management goals. This is gonna require getting out from behind our desks and working directly with communities, practitioners and policymakers to determine what types of responses we wanna foster and where the key levers are for building the capacity to realize them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was a great talk on your research and the research of, of Program One here at the Centre. I have a question actually from, you, uh, from the attendees, Inga Steindl, and I think you're kind of getting at it in the last few minutes of your presentation. Do different fishing communities across the world respond in a similar way to climate change or are they very different? That's a great question that we actually don't have answers for. <laughs> so yeah, that's a critical research frontier. The reality is, again, I sort of touched on it earlier in my talk, is that most of the research on sort of responses to change have been based on hypothetical scenarios, right? So people are presented with a hypothetical scenario and asked, what would you do in this case, right? But as we know, fishing communities all over the world are already being impacted by climate change. Right, so now we actually need to understand, okay, well, how are they adapting? There's, there's much less research on that than you would expect at this mm. point. And so I think that that's something that we really need to start working on. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. And I'll now ask you to turn off your mic and your camera and go get a drink and enjoy the final in our series of short films on the center's legacy, its most significant legacy, its people, and it will be followed by a panel discussion, which I'm really looking forward to with our students, our graduates and our early career researchers, which will be um, moderated by Dr. Carrie Sims. Enjoy. The goal of the ARC Centre of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies is to build human capacity and expertise in coral reef science worldwide and we have achieved it. We're the primary centre globally uh, training people to do research on coral reefs and in marine biology. We've been going uh, just over 15 years in total. Over that time the centre's uh, built partnerships with about 550 institutions. Those collaborators come from over 70 different countries. This centre has supported over 700 higher degree by research students, including 480 PhD students. We have also trained over 130 early career researchers. Over half of our students have gone on to positions at universities and a third have gone on to industry and government, including at our partners, the Australian Institute of Marine Science and the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. Over two thirds of our students and early career researchers are from overseas including countries such as the Philippines, Kenya, Indonesia, the US and Brazil. This has resulted in a network of alumni that are leaders in coral reef research and management across the globe. The notoriety that comes with something like an ARC Centre gives visibility not only to my research, but to me as a researcher as well. The Centre of Excellence um, has a wide array of specialists in all different areas of marine biology. Positioning myself here allowed me to work with different experts in different fields. The ARC Centre does attract some of the top reef scientists around the world. I was able to reach out to a number of experts um, and fill the gaps in my knowledge. I could have trolled the literature, probably myself, but I was able to go directly to the expert. When you have a well-resourced centre, it creates a system where everybody's not in direct competition with each other and then there is the opportunity for people to be generous with their ideas and to just be interested in making the science that the entire centre does the best. I came back to the Centre of Excellence uh, because of the facilities and the support that's available. Especially the aquarium facility we have on campus is extremely large. My role is making sure the students have the skills that they need to undertake the research and be successful. 
One of the things that really struck me initially with the centre is this almost immediate bond and connection that you have with this community of coral reef scientists that goes beyond just your lab group or the walls of your university. A lot of my mentors and my supervisors, um, they're, they're really like friends. It's really a laid back environment and it allows me, I think, to feel really comfortable to ask them questions just about, you know, being a scientist in the world and um, how to progress and, and succeed. When you walk down the corridor, you're walking past student rooms, you're working, walking past early career researcher rooms, they're in no way corralled into different parts of the uh, institutions. We have regular celebrations associated with various, various events that force people out of their caves and into an environment where they're exchanging ideas. We provide opportunities for people to network through programs such as our weekly seminar series, the annual symposium that we run and through the training workshops and professional development opportunities. Being a scientist is almost like running your own small business. You need to do the administration and finance and, and how to organise the fieldwork. I was supported by all my supervisors uh, to be able to achieve all those things. The centre helps facilitate internships primarily through partnerships and through long-term partnerships that we have with organisations. It's a fantastic way of building relationships uh, between our researchers and a workplace that they're very likely to end up at. They get the chance to meet many different people, who, uh, many of whom are working at high levels in other countries or uh, in management positions in other places. I've been lucky enough to be a part of uh, numerous internships and fellowships. Uh, one was on the Schmidt Ocean Institute's research vessel Falker that has a remotely operated vehicle named Sebastian. This robot can dive down, you know, 4,000 meters and collect deep sea corals. And everything you collect down there is something new. There's never been a more important time to be a marine biologist because everything we thought we knew about how coral reefs work is wrong. They're all changing, and they're changing amazingly rapidly. And the legacy of our centre going forward is that we have trained literally hundreds of PhD students and early career researchers. And that capability for many decades will be really, really important for understanding the new dynamics of coral reefs. So welcome back everybody. Um, first, I'd just like to offer my personal congratulations to the Center for the Legacy Videos and the Symposium. I think it's a, a great testament to not only the Center, but all of its peoples and their achievements over these many years. So my name is Carrie Sims. I'm a former Center PhD student at the University of Queensland, and I'm currently at the Australian Institute of Marine Science. So our next and final panel discussion is going to be an insightful one and to some degree is a formidable topic. It is the future of coral reef research. And before we get into it, I'd just like to remind all of our audience members that if you have any uh, questions for one of our speakers, please type it in to the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. I'd also like to invite all of our um, panelists to turn on their videos and their microphones. So I'd also like to start by introducing our panel members for today. We have first Neri Continetto, a PhD student from the University of Western Australia, who is investigating water and sediment dynamics in seagrass ecosystems. We also have Dr. Tanya Kenyon, who is a postdoctoral research fellow and former PhD student 
at the University of Queensland, who studies the physical and biological processes underlying the mobilization and consolidation of coral rubble following disturbances. Deborah Byrne is a PhD student from James Cook University, who is investigating the susceptibility of coral assemblages to disturbance throughout Australia's Coral Sea Marine Park. And Sarah Sutcliffe, a PhD student from James Cook University, who is investigating drivers of food and nutrition security in fisheries dependent coastal communities. So we're going to start off first with um, a session of questions for each of our speakers before we'll go to Q&A questions from our audience. So we're going to start with you, Sarah. What are some examples of ways that we can work with different stakeholder groups and across disciplines to deliver research impact? Thanks. Um, so I guess it's worth saying what is research impact and there's some different ways of measuring that. Um, in my mind, it's making sure that the knowledge that we're generating is actually going towards contributing to effective management and conservation of the reefs that we all care about so much, not just for the sake of the reefs, but also for the millions of people who are dependent on them, for their livelihoods, well-being, and food security. Um, and so as we've heard about, we're in this era of anthropogenic change, which means that we need to be working not just with the reefs, but also with those people who are interacting with them on a daily basis. Um, and as scientists, we need not to be looking at ecological information, but also we need to be working with social scientists, with geographers, with politicians and managers um, who are working with people, working on that side of the equation to make sure that that management and the information that we're generating is actually going to be useful. So we need to understand both people and the ocean. And so that's where the interdisciplinary research that the centre has been engaging with um, is so valuable because as Michelle has just been talking about, we're really getting into some of those issues in a way that hasn't been happening before and we should be continuing to push that moving forward. Uh, in terms of stakeholder engagement, um, as a couple of people have already sort of mentioned, that needs to be happening throughout the entire research process. We need to be making sure that the questions we're asking are actually the ones that we need to answer, that we're filling critical knowledge gaps for people who are working on the ground, for people who are interacting with reefs on a daily basis, who are doing the management. So when we design our research projects, we need to be asking those people what it is they need to know. Um, and then as we go through the process, we can be drawing on the knowledge and resources that reef users have. Um, and then once we've completed our research, that information can't just stay in academic silos, like the most cited papers in the world don't make much difference if we're the only ones who ever read them. Uh, mm -hmm. So we need to be working with people, working with intermediaries like NGOs who have connections and communities, have connections across governments with people that we might not be able to interact with directly. Um, who can help make sure that the information that we're producing, the high quality research that's coming out of the centre is actually being applied in a useful way for the people who need that. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Some important aspects there. Um, so the next question we have is for Deborah. And how have the structure of coral communities changed and how do we expect them to change in the future? Thanks. Um, <clears throat> this is a really good question because many people like to talk about um, declines in coral cover in response to various disturbances, but assessing changes in other metrics, such as the size structure and the taxonomic composition of the coral communities, can really help us better understand the effects of disturbance and recovery trajectories of those communities. So Terry spoke a little bit about this earlier, but generally speaking, we're seeing changes in taxonomic composition but it's fairly dynamic and it is dependent on the types of severities, um, the types and the severities of disturbances that are happening in each location. Um, so a more intermediate disturbance would cause a shift towards a relatively resilient, generally slow growing and less structurally complex taxa like varieties. But then more severe disturbances tend to affect all of the taxa, which actually can cause shifts um, the other way towards the more susceptible fast growing taxa because those are often then the first to grow back afterwards, like the branching of properas. But not just the composition, we also see um, this general decline in the proportion of large corals on reefs. 
which is partly because the recurrent disturbances and not allowing enough time for regrowth of those new recruits, but also partly because of this constant degradation and partial mortality of old and large corals. And then less, um, less large colonies, they effectively, you're then seeing a, a lower fecundity. And then in some locations, we've then seen recruitment limitation because of this. Um, so a future of few small structurally simple corals sounds really pessimistic, but without seeing more action to curb anthropogenic climate change and other causes of coral reef degradation, that is what models are predicting. But if we do take action, those same models, they do predict that there's still time for coral communities to regrain their, their structure and function. Um, and at the same time, there's all this research happening that might fundamentally change our understanding of what the future might look like for coral assemblages. Um, things like the adaptive capacity of corals, like trait heritability, transgenerational plasticity, um, starting to understand better the natural drivers of recovery on reefs. And of course, this huge effort to understand if and how we might be able to actively restore certain areas of reef. So it's really exciting and important time to be part of coral reef research. Um, and potentially even influence what coral assemblages may look like in the future. Thanks, Deborah. So our next question is for Tanya. So Tanya, what is the role of reef restoration in managing coral reefs in the future? Thanks, Carrie. Um, I'll just preface this by saying that I don't pretend to be an expert on reef restoration, but I'm working in the space at the moment as part of the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program, RRAP. So uh, yeah, I think a lot of people agree that the role of reef restoration in managing coral reefs into the future is increasing, but that restoration has to be rolled out in a holistic way. So in tandem with um, local action and strong global action on climate change. In one of our RRAP meetings, we were shown modeling where, you know, even if all of these potential restoration methods were implemented in a business as usual climate scenario, those reefs are still going to degrade and decline. However, we're in a position now where even in a zero emission scenario, we're going to see legacy warming. So for several decades to come. Um, so the hope is, you know, number one, we curb emissions. And then number two, that innovative reef restoration methods will be able to sort of bridge that gap and maintain functioning on these coral reefs as they navigate this uh, legacy warming. And uh, reef restoration is transforming from what it's traditionally been. So fragging and outplanting corals in small areas um, to more innovative methods that we're looking at now, like cloud brightening and larval enhancement. And in the future, even more advanced methods that we are unknown to us now. So unfortunately, the reality of coral reef restoration is that it's far behind in terms of technology and understanding in comparison to uh, terrestrial or even coastal. Uh, ecosystem restoration. So many reef restoration projects to date have been pretty small scale and there's been a bit of a lack of communication between scientists and managers and those that are actually practicing restoration. So I think as the profile of reef restoration is raised and there's more funding for projects um, like RRAP, this communication will improve and then we'll see improved outcomes in terms of data collection and reporting and that will then feed into management. And we can also learn a lot about existing and future ecological habitats and processes through restoration projects. So, for example, in the rubble stabilization subprogram that I'm working in, we're investigating rubble movement and consolidation and coral recruitment processes in rubble, which are um, important processes going on in rubble, which is a habitat that's going to become more uh, common in the future. Thanks. Thanks, Tanya. And we also have Neri. So Neri, how do you think innovations in technology are influencing the types of research questions that we can ask? Thanks, Gary. Um, so I thought of um, this question is something that is very interesting because it changes over time, not just because of technologies, but also um, on how we perceive our, our own research. And I came up with three different points. I think for me, they are the most important ones. And one is about coupling between the theory and analytical models. The second one is about uh, the scale of our research questions. And the third one is about communication. So the first one, I think the improvement of technologies um, 
have allowed us to do a better coupling between lab work, which is a controlled environment, the analytical models, and what we see in the physical environment, the what we call like the fields or the real world. Um, and this was possible because of you know sensor advancement over the last few years, which had a much better, which now have a much better precision. And also internal characteristics of the instruments, such as batteries that last much longer. And this completely optimize our work. And because of that, we can do a feedback with the with the equations that were developed in controlled setting that will fi feed the equations that, that can be proved again into the, the field. And this creates a positive feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, also, data storage. Uh, storage is something that we we is remarkable for us how much uh, we our compos com compositional power increased over the past years and this enabled us to work with much larger data sets that we will again uh, enable us to create new questions and uh, and see much more and see the like the the whole big the full picture uh, about this the second point is about the scales and Yes, uh, first, first of all, we think about all the macro scale that we can work with uh, remote sensing satellites and drones and they, they allow us to think in a much bigger scale and also in a time scale as well with monitoring. But also we can go and this is very uh, true for my work in particular, we can go in a much smaller scale as well and we can now study the very tiny processes less than one centimeter in the field work or into lab work because we now have better technologies to deal with that and then we can kind of see a new world which is a much smaller scale and the third one is communication and you know this what we are doing right now is a very good example of that like i don't need to fly to queensland to have a, a, a meeting and see my peers so not just the the technology is not just the AI kind of thing, but also what we are doing right now, which is five years ago, Skype was awful. We could barely talk to each other. And now, you know, we are sitting on a panel, on panel. Yeah. <laughs> and with different sizes, but still. Um, so yeah, uh, I think the communication tools are um, amazing and, and they make things much more democratic. So people and research groups that don't have that much money or they come from the global south, they can still engage into important uh, conferences and, and they can engage not just physically, but also with open source uh, softwares and codes and data that we can all share. And, and this is very important for diversity. And if we have a diverse group, we can ultimately ask ourselves about our own research question that we are making and, you know, just changing ideas and everything. Thanks very much, Neri. So we do have some questions coming through from the audience. The first one, I believe, is to any or all of our panelists. How do you think your lives as researchers will differ from the lives of your advisors? Anyone? I think that the way that research is funded is changing. I think there's an increasing need for us to be um, engaging with industry funding and um, working with um, people outside of pure academia, working with like NGOs and other partners. Um, and that push for applied research impact as opposed to blue sky research um, is getting stronger from what I've heard from people who are currently in grant writing processes um, and obviously there's a huge amount of benefit to blue sky research and not being able to do that as much as a loss to science but I think that that's what's that's the way that it's going yeah um <clears throat> I love this question <laughs> um I I think being in ecology looking at sort of parallel ecology my advisors um spent a lot of time you know looking at broad scale ecology but then started documenting this sort of slow demise and trying to understand how fast are we losing reefs and so on and so on I like to think that whilst this is kind of how I've started that my career going forward will be more 
optimistic, looking at, okay, well, how is the reef recovering? And, um, you know, what, what, can we, what can we learn about the reefs in terms of their capacity to recover? How can we facilitate recovery? And I really hope to be able to see our generation make these huge changes at all of these, you know, levels where we start to see these positive changes. And I cross all my fingers and toes that this is something that I can, you know, document and watch it happen. That's, that's what I, I hope that's how it will be different for me. <laughs> fingers crossed, definitely. I, I think um, not, not particularly my, my advisors, but in terms <laughs> of advice, because his, um, you know, um, but advisors in general, I think um, our generation and this new gener this generation now, um, there are a few issues that are, are, are being talked more about. So things like engagement with um, the whole society and giving back to the society that are funding our research and diversity in, in, into the research world. I think this kind of debate kind of started between five and not started, but became stronger between five to 10 years ago. And we, I think that what we see as a trend is that we are taking this more serious for the, like from now on. It seems a common theme for all of your um, questions, certainly collaboration and the importance of that, collaborating not um, just the scientific disciplines, but outside in industry as well. We're gonna need that if we're gonna modernize with technology, et cetera. Mm. Yeah, I was going to say that that networking and just the, like the sheer number of researchers now, perhaps the pace of research is a little faster than what it was for our advisors. And perhaps we'll see, you know, greater progress within our careers um, in, in contrast to all the, the negatives of the instability and com competition yeah. and, and all that. Yeah. All right. I have another question to any or all of our panelists. Do you see the role of collaboration in marine science changing? And do you have ideas for ways to drive more collaborative science in the future? So touching on what we just spoke a bit about. Mm, I think, um, mm. it's, it's a hard question. I think, um, well, I mean, we've already touched on how um, it's definitely becoming more collaborative and we've touched a little bit on how important it is to be more multidisciplinary with with you know how we're approaching different branches of science um but also yeah I think also looking at um management and and practitioners and yeah I, I'm not sure I think we've touched on quite a few of those things already but I guess I think Sarah may be working more closely with Indigenous or traditional owners in incorporating their knowledge as well, the traditional science. Absolutely, Indigenous people and um, just reef users in general, rather than having sort of like um, parachute research where scientists go into a community, find all of the knowledge and leave as if we're like observing people the way that we would observe mm -hmm. an ecosystem, which is just a very colonialist way of doing research that's not how it should be happening um and so i think that there's um a, a huge push for knowledge co-production and for long-term relationships with um communities where we're doing research knowing that they've been there for a long time and they'll be there once we finish this funding round and move on to another project so mm -hmm. um generating research in collaboration with people asking the questions they need answers to um, working with them and respecting the knowledge they have through that process and then working with them to use the research in a way that's actually helpful and useful to them when we're done. And asking those questions early on rather than, you know, after you've got the funding for something and then um, coming to them and, mm. and saying, what can you do with this sort of part yeah. of the process? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we have another question for any and all. Do you feel like you are provided the best training as a researcher of the future? Where do you think this could be improved? It's an important question, yeah. I, I, if, I may, if I may start, I do mm. think the training is, is, is great. I think we do have very good, uh, amazing researchers uh, and also, and especially meeting all, the, all, all, 
and not other uh, researchers is is great for us and gives us a lot of knowledge as well, exchanging ideas. One thing coming from a place where we study, I'm doing physical oceanography, so it's like very numbers and maths and equations. One thing that I do feel like we lack a bit is questioning ourselves. So having a bit of philosophy, if I might say. Yeah. And like why, are, yes, two days ago we had, uh, no, yesterday, we had the epistemology course and that was amazing for me. And I think this is something that we all should be doing. Like, what are we researching? Why are we researching that? And how and, you know, what, what are we going to do with this information? I think these are all, doesn't matter what field you're from, if you're studying this space, this is still important. And that can feed into, I guess, science communication um, training and communicating your idea if you, you need to come from a space where you're clear in what you're doing and why you're doing it to communicate it to others. But I found the science communication um, training in the center really good in particular and also um, statistical training. Um, mm -hmm. I found that very yeah beneficial. <laughs> I think as students within the center, we're given such a wealth of opportunities to learn um, and, and progress and I'm, um, you know, the, the center and the student committee in the center put on so many different professional development activities from, you know, statistics and writing and, and presenting. But one thing that I, I did this year that I thought was really interesting and um, could maybe see a little bit more of in the future was um, we had a workshop with um, a traditional owner and it was part of the traditional partnerships at Ames. Um, and I found it really interesting um, learning from that team about how we can better facilitate our research within um, those uh, traditional communities on the Great Barrier Reef and elsewhere. Um, mm -hmm. And it's something that uh, being English, it's not something that I necess necessarily um, think about. It's not the first thing that springs to my mind always. So I thought it was really important. To, you know sit down and, and really learn about that and I think that's it's really important for all of the students coming from all kinds of different backgrounds to learn about. Certainly. Yeah. Uh, we have another question to everyone. As an early career scientist I'm amazed how much the pandemic has imp impacted PhD students, postdocs and other young scientists. Job markets, lockdown, no travel, no field work as examples. If a pandemic can have such effects, what about the effects of climate change on our careers? That's a good, good question. I like. <laughs> I, I always think about as, as a, I, you know, I do coral ecology, and one of the things I genuinely am worried about, <laughs> yeah, is that well, when the coral's gone, what am I going to do? <laughs> you can come study rubble. Yeah. <laughs> Well, as Terry mentioned, as future scientists, we're going to have to relearn these new systems. So we have to reinvent ourselves with these new systems, I guess. Mm. I think some of the sort of other aspects of life as a researcher, like dragging 2,000 people from all over the world to go to a conference is as much as it's a lot more fun to do that in person than online. And as much as I'm sick of Zoom calls, that is a much more climate friendly way of collaborating. Yeah. Um, so I think we'll be seeing more and more of that. Mm. Yeah, for sure. I think as well, we just have to adapt, right? Like these effects of climate change are, uh, you know, they're, they're giving us new questions to ask really, I suppose, you know, it's, it's sad, but it's interesting, you know, there's a whole wealth of different things that we can work on mm. because of climate change, I suppose. We just have to, you know, be a bit bendy and <laughs> try and work with it. I think we are out of time, unfortunately, for our questions and for our panel discussion today. Um, so I'd like to thank all of our panel members, uh, Tanya, Neri, Deborah, and Sarah for your time and for your knowledge and your insight into understanding the future of coral reef science, um, and also for the audience for their questions. So now I'm going to hand over to Graham Cumming for his closing remarks. Uh, Graham, could you please turn on your microphone and video?
Great, thanks, Carrie, and our and our panelists on that panel. I'm always so encouraged every time I hear or interact with our young and emerging researchers. I really think um, it's fantastic how you've been involved in the centre, and it's really interesting to hear these perspectives coming through. So I don't. Uh, I think I'm going to leave the last word to the panelists in terms of the content of this uh, symposium. It's been fantastic to hear reflections on the past, present, and future of the centre. Um, and I'd like to just wrap up by thanking uh, a number of people who I think uh, really deserve our thanks. So um, I'd like to start off with thanking Vice Chancellor Sandra Harding for officially opening the, the um, symposium. I'd like to thank our three excellent plenary speakers, Terry Hughes, John Pandolfi and Michelle Barnes. I'd like to thank Ryan Lowe and Carrie Sims for moderating the panel and the different panel members, Katerina, Ove, David, Mia, Deborah, Tanya, Neri and Sarah. In addition, I'd like to say thanks a lot to Alana Gresh for being such a good and uh, coherent MC throughout this. Thank you, Alana. Behind the scenes, there's obviously been a lot of organization to make this event happen. I'm particularly grateful to the symposium committee. They've had to reorganize and reorient this whole symposium a couple of times. We were originally hoping to do it in person and then we had to cancel because of COVID uncertainty. So particular thanks there to Jenny Lappin of Doherty, Maria Nefer, Alana Gresh, Morgan Pratchett, Tiffany Morrison, and John Pandolfi. And a special thank you, uh, another special thank you to, to Maria and Viv for organizing the logistics of this online event. We're also very grateful to JCUIT, especially Andrew Norton for his assistance with webinar logistics, and to Mangrove Media, Jimmy Pirtle and the production of the short films, uh, and Chun Wong for the symposium animations. So on that note, I'd like to say thank you very much, all of you, for your time and your participation. And uh, I really trust that this is not, um, although we're coming to the end of one funding cycle, um, that you'll all join me in seeing this as a time of renewal and um, regeneration, that we can move on from here into deeper, greater things, build on the foundation we've got, um, and continue to challenge the, the fields we're in um, and advance both science and the practice of science uh, around the world. So thank you everybody and um, officially declare this closed. Lady Blue, feel the waves in my hair, so calm and cool. Perfect, no despair. I wish I could swim here forever, Miss Lady Blue.
Miss Lady.